Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, hello. <clears throat> How's everybody doing this evening? Hopefully, you're doing well. And uh, hopefully this uh, evening's class will go much smoother than last week's class. That would be uh, that would be a pleasant change, uh, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> last week's class was a disaster. Um, we were having all kinds of technical issues. Hopefully this evening's classes uh, will uh, pick up and uh, do much better and all and then Wednesday's class coming up we are going to revisit that uh, TNG uh, those uh, wonderful uh, folks over at uh, Planet CNC informed me that they had changed the way they set up the uh, codes for creating their buttons and then you know they didn't update the uh, their instructions and things um, and uh, you know <laughs> uh, heads up would have been nice uh, but uh, you know they've got so many things going on over there and creating so many wonderful products and stuff um, it's uh, but we're able you know I was able to uh, this weekend create buttons and all that wonderful thing and uh, uh, it weren't like a champ so we're gonna revisit that again on Wednesday and um, <clears throat> tonight we're gonna talk about uh, you know uh, creating and carving urns uh, now the the title is uh, pet urns but the same principles and everything would apply for you know human urns as well uh, for loved ones and things now um, we're gonna look at a couple of different things we are gonna be working in a combination of uh, Vetric VCar Pro uh, which uh, desktop pro and Aspire will apply to everything we do in here you know you can use all three of the software uh, but we're also gonna do a little bit of work in Aspire to show how to create some custom curves and things uh, to your boxes and, and, and designs and stuff. Uh, so we're going to work in a little bit of Aspire today to show that off as well. The, uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, that's popping in. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time with me tonight. And like I said, I hope everything goes uh, smoothly. I do want to have, while I have everybody here or uh, all of you here, I want to have an update or give you an update. Um, the uh, new uh, quick set touch plate uh, toolpath geco generator uh, for uh, the DWC quick set uh, I was using it this weekend uh, worked like a champ uh, but I did discover when uh, including a tool change that I had it set up to move only in the positive direction when the tool moved uh, you know back to uh, you know be able to make a tool change before the Z touch off and there was times where I wanted it to move in the negative direction, uh, you know, negative X or negative Y uh, versus the positive direction and all. And I didn't have in the uh, program the ability to um, to do that, uh, to put in like a negative 3.0 or something, and it moved to that position and then moved back to where it needed to be, uh, you know, for the Z touch off and all properly uh, to include that negative and things in there, that positive, should I say, if it was a negative. So I'm going to be working on that. I'm going to uh, uh, change the code a little bit, and I'm going to release an update for it uh, in the uh, owners group uh, this week. Um, just uh, keep an eye out for it. Be sure to download it if you did download the the digital uh, the Quickset uh, Geco generator program that I made. Uh, be sure to um, download the newest version and install it and stuff when I get it out because. Uh, like I said, I got a chance to really use it. Uh, worked like a champ every time and uh, really happy with it. But I did notice that, like I said, during the tool change operation, it only moved in the positive direction. There were times where I wanted to move in the negative and I didn't allow for that in the programming. Uh, so I'm just going to make a quick change and uh, so I can allow for that and I'll release that update to everyone. All right. 
So a uh, uh, little bit of a, uh, you know, it's a topic. I mean, we have to, you know, we do, we cremate uh, people, we cremate animals, we cremate, you know, uh, uh, marshmallows at campfires and stuff and all. And so we need to build uh, a memorial box for these occasions, <laughs> except for the marshmallows. We just eat those. But um, so let's get into it and let's look at uh some of the different approaches and uh see if we can come up with a nice uh layout and style all right with that being said let's go ahead and switch over to our vetric we're going to start off in the vetric vcar pro and um once we get into the pro uh, let me minimize my aspire here and get into the pro <clears throat> Now, when it comes to the uh, job setup, we, we with any urn, uh, whether you are um, building a memorial urn for a loved one that's passed or a uh, beloved pet or something, um, we need to know the proper size. You know, we need to make sure that when we build or assemble this box, uh, this vessel, whatever you want to call it uh that um the remains uh human or pet uh will be able to fit and so we need to make sure that we calculate the proper cubic inches um so on the inside of the box you know we want to measure the length the width and then uh measure that by the height uh to get our cubic inches and um you know uh for when it comes to human or pet remains uh, for every pound, uh, it creates uh, one cubic inch of uh, um, ash, ashes, and all. So uh, let's say that we had a hundred-pound dog. Uh, then I want uh, you know a hundred cubic inches of internal space, but I also want to add an additional ten cubic inches of uh, space to that uh, to ensure that um, you know everything fits properly and also that it you know captures the essence of our loved ones um, so we want to make sure that when we size our project um, and whether we are carving this uh, you know whether we're de designing and carving the lid uh, we're cutting the uh, sideboards and things that when it's all said and done uh, and these parts get mitered or they get dovetailed or they get, uh, you know, um, rabbit jointed. Uh, uh, however, we're going to assemble the box. Um, we want to make sure that when, uh, upon final assembly that that internal area uh, provides enough space for the remains. So... Like I said, for about one pound of, uh, you know, one pound, we create about uh, one cubic inch of ash. Okay, so I am going to uh, base everything off of, um, let's say, uh, not that I'm, you know, my, my, my pup here, uh, Maya, she's an American Bulldog. <clears throat> she weighs 120 pounds, uh, so I need at least uh, 130 cubic inches of space. Um, uh, I need to create a, an area that's at least 130 cubic inches. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Let me get a hold of this Dr. Pepper real quick and clear my throat. So I want to, um, and that's the 120 cubic inches for... Uh, the actual remains and then an extra 10 additional cubic inches uh you know for just to make sure that everything fits in there comfortably and uh there's an old saying you know they want to capture the uh uh essence of the you know animal or person and also the 10 cubic inches accounts for that all right so this is going to be a double-sided project um we're going to be uh you know carving on one side or cutting out our you know our panes and things uh, on one side and then we will be flipping uh, this over for uh, the other side so first of all let's open up a calculator and let's see what I you know if I 
<clears throat> let's kind of uh, see if we can come up with a particular uh, size and stuff. So if I have a, uh, a box that has a height of five and a half inches in height and a length, if I'm going, I can either go rectangular, I can go square. Uh, if I had a fourth axis, I could go round, you know, all of these things. Um, but we're, we're working on the table. So uh, I, I'm gonna say, let's start off first and let's look at a box that has an internal, and these are internal dimensions, guys, by the way, this is internal dimensions. Um, I will uh, determine what the external is, uh, you know, uh, after, but on my internal dimensions of my box. So uh, if I go five and a half inches uh, in uh, width or length, let's call it, or width, whichever way we're going to orientate our box, uh, by, let's go, let's start with a uh, six and a half inch area and, um, multiply that by four inches tall I'm gonna have hundred and forty three cubic inches so I only need a hundred and thirty hundred and forty three is uh, definitely uh, plenty of room so that size uh, for an internal area is uh, what I'm gonna be working with now I need to determine how what my distance or what my length is uh, you know, for the external, for the actual board itself. And so if we were to um, just kind of uh, jump in real quick to, I'm going to use SketchUp uh, just real quick to draw out a board uh, to better, you know, uh, simulate this. Let me get down to my SketchUp. <clears throat> Let that uh, SketchUp window open. All right, so I'm going to, oops, I don't want to edit. I'm going to draw a rectangle, and we're going to go a uh, length of uh, 6.5 by 5.5 for that internal area. Enter, and I'm gonna push pull this up to, uh, let's say that I was using three quarter inch material. You know, the thickness of material is gonna also, you know, it's gonna be determined, uh, you know, that's really gonna determine, you know, the exterior size as well. Now, if I take and uh, let me rotate this a little bit. If I take and grab a protractor here and I'm gonna rotate 45 degrees and I'm going to kind of draw out a line and let's uh, go ahead and connect that and I want to go ahead and uh, pull uh, this over to this side as well because remember, I was talking earlier about uh, internal dimensions. So let me grab a protractor. Oops, uh, let me escape out of that. And let's pull 45 degrees this way. Grab my line tool. Snap to that point and snap to there. And I'll go ahead and uh, just for kicks and giggles, we'll spin this around, push, pull, and pull this out. <clears throat> P for push, pull, pull this out uh, to this face. And so now I can come in and let's get rid of these lines now and if I take a measurement now <clears throat> excuse me 
I take a measurement, my overall length of my board before that miter cut, if I was doing miter, is gonna be eight inches, right? Now, my, of course, my five and a half is still going to remain the same. Uh, my five and a half inches is still going to remain the same, but that miter cut, uh, if I'm gonna miter this box, uh, took my, um, you know, my original six and a half inches and added this additional length, which brought it to eight inches. And so that's what, you know, that's what we need to kind of uh, be working with. Now, that, again, that's gonna give me uh, 143 uh, cubic inches of space on the inside. If I um, wanted to reduce that down, then I could reduce my size, but th this would be, this this will be okay uh, for now. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna go <clears throat> along my X eight inches I don't know why my throat is uh, so froggy tonight. Uh, I'm gonna go with a height of five and a half inches and a thickness of three quarters. Now, of course, again, if I was using half inch material, uh, then that would, you know, that would change uh, the dimensions and stuff if I wanted that five and a half by six and a half internal area. Uh, so you just, you know, make sure that you uh, kind of do the math on it. Now I will be um, referencing off of the same face. So when I when I'm flip this board, or the first part of the board, I will be touching off on the top of the board. Uh, and when this board gets flipped over, I will be touching off on my waste board or my tabletop if I'm not using a waste board. It all depends on if I'm cutting through. Uh, if I'm cutting through, then I will be using a waste board, so I will touch off to the top of that. If I'm not cutting through and I'm just doing some carving and things, uh, then um, I'm going to uh, you know, touch off on my tabletop. But we're flipping this board. So if we flip this board and we're not using a waste board, then the alignment pin method is out of the window, right? So we would have to clamp this in a way that when we, uh, you know, uh, we would have to clamp this in a way by building some kind of a frame, 90 degree jig or something around to uh, trap it, that when we flip it, we are maintaining the same orientation, the same place, right? If we weren't using a waste board, we can't, we don't have anything to put our alignment pins into, right? So we would have to figure out another way to jig up or clamp this board uh, to be able to flip it and maintain our position things now uh, for this um, I will be uh, on here you can start off on the center or any of the four corners of your board uh, we are that's our XY datum position and for this I will be using the uh, DWC quick set so I am going to reference I am going to reference off the bottom left corner uh, for this and um, you know, I've gotten more and more uh, used to, I like working with it. Um, and uh, a lot of you are just now kind of getting the opportunity uh, to work with the DWC quick set because, you know, you might have migrated over to TNG and didn't, you know, know how, okay, how do I touch off in TNG or how do I even touch off and, and use it in the, the um, uh, CNC USB controller? Well, CNC USB controller had built in functions. Um, and uh, the TNG, you know, didn't those when we when we migrated over, we lost those built-in functions. But uh, I was pleasantly happy to hear that the new update of TNG, uh, which is the 4.04 or 0.04, um, uh, they've integrated some of those new changes in there, so we uh, we can use those as well. But now we have the G code generator as well to help us out. And uh, a lot of you guys and girls are just now getting the opportunity. You've had your quick sets for a while, have never used them, and you're getting the opportunity. Well, I, I've gotten to use mine uh, from the prototyping phase, and I begin liking it more and more. I used to be working off the center. I still work off the center for a lot, but uh, lately I've been working off the corner. So that's where we're going to work for this. But you can absolutely, any of these files that I share with you, you can change your uh, setup in any way necessary just be sure to recalculate the toolpath you should never take a toolpath for granted anyway you should always recalculate it and check them for uh, speeds feeds and, and settings and all to make sure that they uh, are uh, accurate for your bits and in your machining methods all right so we are going to start off on the bottom left corner and i am going to flip 
along the x direction. We can flip either x or y, it doesn't matter. But we have to choose which way we're gonna flip because that's going to tell the program which way to orientate the vectors on the other side so that everything uh, you know calculates and comes out correctly. So uh, we definitely have to pick that. And I'm gonna go along the x-axis for the flipping. And I'm gonna click OK and this is gonna be my setup. Now my small box uh, is going to have an internal dimension of uh, five and a half, uh, six and a half in the length by five and a half uh, uh, wide. So my um, boards, if I have the 2440, I can cut two sides, you know, and two, I can use two separate boards uh, and I can cut both pieces, both parts. I don't have to cut them out individually. I've got this set up for an individual piece, which would be, I mean, it's doable, but it kind of makes no sense, right? Uh, you know, we could, if, we, if we can put a longer board in there and cut either all four pieces out, if we have that room, uh, if we had like, you know, we have that 24 by 40 inches, I can definitely get the four parts out of a board on that 40 inch. Even on the 24, let's see here, six uh, times four is 24. Uh, we're going uh, we're going eight eight times four is 32 so the doing uh, all four pieces out of one board would exceed my mini carver uh, but be plenty of room on my 2440 so on my mini carver I would just cut out two pieces the the front and back and the two sides most likely um, so I've got this set up for a uh, you know just a single-sided piece well, I'm going to go back into that job dimensions and I am going to set this up. We're going to do two and two. We're going to assume that we have a smaller table. And so 16 would be two of my parts, but I need space in between those parts and I need spaces on the ends. So I'm going to go uh, 18, not 28. Let's let, let me learn how to type. I'm going to go 18 and a, <laughs> one more time, 18.5 inches. All right, there we go. All right, and that's going to be my job setup because I am going to cut uh, both parts out of here. And I will um, uh, cut out. Did that take? Did that take? It didn't look like it took. No, it didn't. Uh, always hit OK instead of cancel. And uh, you will be good. 18.5. Let it generate and get that OK button. I clicked cancel and it went back right to what I had it originally. All right, now we need to kind of lay out our work areas. We know that this we're going to be uh, either might you know we're going to be cutting this part out. And what I'm going to do for that is on the two parts, I'm just going to have a line that I'm going to have my CNC uh, cut maybe with a V bit or something, just a kind of a dividing line that I can take over to my table saw and uh, cut the two parts in half because ultimately I'm gonna end up mitering uh, this, uh, these parts. Now, if I didn't have a table saw, all I had was a CNC, I could absolutely, uh, when, this is, when this part would be on the back side, um, I, you know, uh, I could actually mill the miters right into it. Uh, and um, you know it would just be a matter of uh, setting up a, in a sense a uh, fluting toolpath or something uh, so I could mill those in there but I'm going to set mine up that I do have at least a jigsaw uh, band saw or a table saw any of the three will do a skill saw and uh, whatever the case may be but I'm gonna carve this board out and then I'm going to separate the two pieces and then I'm gonna make my miter cuts uh, to assemble this box because I am going to do a mitered uh, design, a mitered box design. But I will also uh, show if we had to do some joinery, maybe some rabbit joints and all, you know, for the box. I think the closed off ends, uh, uh, like a mitered box, would be more uh, appropriate, especially when we get into what I'm going to be looking at or showing you in the Aspire software. Uh, but you can absolutely do, you know, butt joints, uh, rabbited joints, uh, finger joints, dovetails, whatever you want. 
um, you can you can cut your ends however you need. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and lay out our um, eight. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Our yeah, we'll start off with our eight uh, by five and a half. So while I've got my mouse held, uh, I am in V9, so I can go ahead and type in eight comma five point five, enter uh, to create that uh, part. Or you can absolutely use the menu in the rectangle tool over here by typing in, we want our center, you know, wherever you might want it to fall, and uh, you can type in the length and width. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and get that into uh, a uh, general position. And there's two ways that I can make my second vector, my second rectangular vector. One, while I'm in transform mode, meaning that I have either double clicked on it to put it in transform mode on this object, or I have went over to the edit object menus transform mode uh, tool and uh, activated it. And while I'm in transform mode, I can hold down my control and alternate key. I want to use the alternate key because with the alternate key, it keeps me on the axis no matter where my mouse is. You see my little indicator up there where my mouse is. It's keeping me in alignment with the first object. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, let go of there. Now, that's one way I could create the vector. Uh, the second way is I could absolutely mirror it as well. I can use the transform objects menu. I can mirror it and I can create a mirrored copy and flip it about job center. So, or I could just freehand draw another rectangle, however you want to get your shapes on, on point. Now, I want a certain space between the two parts. So I will use, uh, while this uh, uh, object here is selected, I'm going to uh, select the first rectangle last and I'm gonna use the alignment tool and I'm going to align to the outside edge of that part. And with that, I can deselect them and now reselect this rectangle. And I wanna move it relative to its current position along the x-axis, left and right on your screen is your x-axis of your CNC up and down. Your uh, height of your screen represents the y. And so, I want to move it relative. I want at least, I'm gonna be using a quarter inch end mill uh, to cut out these two parts. Uh, so that's, you know, for, for both parts, I need at least that quarter inch gap, but I also want uh, some meat in the middle. So I'm gonna go uh, and put a uh, 0.625 in between and click apply. Now I am going to come in here and select both of the objects and I can do that by drawing the selection window around them or I can just come in and click hold down my shift key and click on the second object to uh, you know select both of sides either way uh, now back into my alignment tool I'm gonna make sure that those two parts are centered on my material now here's where the problem in lies or falls okay or no, I'm sorry, it doesn't in line and fall. Um, I thought I drew these parts short. Uh, these are my eight, this is my outside dimension, so they're, that's right. Uh, now I want to create my internal dimension so I know where to, because I'm gonna have miter cuts on the end of this, so I need to know where I'm gonna be doing my carving, uh, cutting out, or whatever the case may be, so that I don't accidentally, depending on how deep my carving is and all, I don't come into that miter cut or something like that. I don't want, you know, uh, to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that uh, rectangle tool back up. And I'm gonna um, come in and just somewhere in the general area, I'm going to kind of freehand draw. And this is going to be a length of 6.5. I'm typing in the physical. If you look at the bottom right of the screen, you will see that value 6.5. So 6.5 comma, that's my width, the comma separates width and height, 5.5, and click enter to lock that in. And I'm going to once again select that object I just drew and select the outer boundary of my board piece. Uh, and I'm going to use the alignment tool and this time I'm going to center to that last object that I selected. I wanna center it in there. 
and um, you know create that kind of this is my work area now while I have um, it in the position for here and everything is centered and separated and all I'm gonna go ahead and mirror this I'm gonna go ahead and mirror this horizontally to get it into the other part as well so now I have my two pieces and I've got my vectors kind of laid out now mind you uh, I am <clears throat> cutting uh, this board is cut down to the exact dimensions on the y-axis the width of the board should I say it is cut down to the exact dimensions uh, so uh, these overlapping lines of the inner rectangle and the outer rectangle I'm not worried about because I am these are just my boundaries I'm not using them to do any profile cuts or anything like that um, they're not going to cause any complications with the toolpath uh, if this board was larger and all, um, and I was still, it didn't matter if I was cutting this part out, uh, then um, I'm only going to be selecting that outside boundary. This internal area is not to be really used for anything except for a reference window for where my design is going to go. All right. Now, if you're wondering why, or you might not be wondering why, you may, uh, you know, but I'll tell you uh, why I'm kind of going into longer explanations and stuff is because we do have some new users, um, and uh, uh, the um, with the new users and all, I want them to have a uh, complete understanding of what we're doing. Now, <clears throat> the uh, remember what I said about having a center line uh, just I'm gonna have the V bit carve a small maybe a sixteenth or an eighth inch deep line groove here so I have something like a reference line when I'm setting up at my table saw or my band saw or whatever uh, I want a reference little groove cut there that I can cut along um, and uh, so I'm and I can also draw a pencil mark you know if I wanted to but I'm gonna take my line tool and I'm going to uh, come along here and I'm going to snap to the uh, top and I'm going to just straight down 90 degrees snap to the bottom. Now in V9, Vetric V9, uh, when you have your uh, smart snapping on as well as your geometry snapping and things, um, let me say that backwards, smart snapping and geometry snapping, uh, if you noticed, um, and I'll undo that line. If you noticed when I had my line tool, when I came over to this center point, you see that line, that dotted line pop up on the screen. Um, that dotted line is letting me know that I am at a snap point, which is in this case happens to be the center of the board. Uh, we've got that uh, crosshair, uh, you know, um, little uh, mouse indicator, but um, you know, anywhere along this, you know, I have different snap points on the corners, but I actually physically have that center line, so it's actually drawing it for me. And now all I have to need to do is just, like I said, one click for the uh, first, and then come down and snap to this outer edge. Oops, did I snap short? I think I snapped short, so let's, uh, I'm going to click undo on that. And I'm going to pull back down and make sure that my mouse is on that edge. There we go. <clears throat> All right, space bar to finish. I believe I didn't snap short, but I might have. Okay, so now we have that center line. Now it comes into uh, kind of basically the decoration. Now this again, this is only guys. This is only the uh, the sides, uh, the front and back, and the in the two sides uh, that we're working on here. Uh, we're going to go in and we're going to create a, uh, a part for the top as well uh, to cut the top out and all. Um, and we can even cut out the, you know, the part for the base, depending on uh, uh, if I'm going to do any decorative edges on the base where I can use my molding toolpath, you know, to create that pattern. Um, or, uh, you know, if I just wanted, if I just, it's a base, uh, I could literally cut out a square, the, the part. Uh, you know with my table saw I could take it over to my router table with a you know a profile bit in there and, and knock it out but again if assuming that we don't have these kind of tools in our shop you know we only have we might only have the CNC well then I want to be able to show you the different ways that we can create that all right so what are we gonna do for our decoration well if we come over um, <clears throat> I want to show you something new 
in uh, the uh, design and make area. Uh, I believe it's new for me. It is. Um, if this, uh, you know, we are going to assume we're going to work on the assumption that this is a. Um, we're going to work on the assumption that this is a. Uh, oh God! There was a there was a term I was going to use. Bear with me. <laughs> that this is a pet urn. That this we're going to assume that this is a pet urn. Um, well, uh, under we're going to click on clip art here. The the word pet urn uh, threw me for a minute. Uh, we're going to click on uh, click here to browse the the uh, product catalog, and designandmake.com is a Vetric uh, you know program. And I'm going to come in here and let's say that this is an urn for my dog. I'm going to type in dog in the uh, little search window up here. Uh, so it's going to pull up uh, the uh, dog animals. Now, there are uh, some wonderful uh, collections of models uh, that you can actually buy collections or you can buy the models individually. Um, but they have a lot of different uh, breeds um, that we can uh, choose from and you know we might be working with uh, a particular we might have a pet that is a, uh, of a particular breed we may have a pet that is not of a particular breed um, and uh, therefore you know finding a model if we wanted to include a model uh, might you know prove to be difficult now with me I have uh, an American Bulldog uh, Maya and uh, I you won't find them I wouldn't find a model uh, in here unfortunately they, they can't have every um, you know every breed of animal but um, there is uh, you know no uh, representation of a model if I wanted something close to the breed of my pet uh, there's nothing in here that would represent you know my american bulldog you know the bulldog is a completely different breed so uh we can ebay search we can you know do whatever if we have a spire we can you know we can import a photo and create almost like a little lithophane type thing if we have photo v carve we could as well but you know i want you to know that there are a lot of wonderful models and things um that uh you can um work with uh, within, uh, you know, uh, the Vetric. Now, when it comes to cats or something, um, there's not a whole lot uh, in the uh, cat realm. Uh, they're just, you know, some generic type photos, so nothing specific to any breeds or anything. So, you know, you got to figure out which way you're going to go. But I want you to know, uh, you know, about design and make. Many of you do because it's a Vetric item. Uh, many of you used it and all, but I want you to know, you know, you can keyword search and look for those special things. It may just be you want some kind of memorial uh, emblem or something uh, that, uh, you know, that, 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 that that's not even of an animal, of a breed or anything like that. You might just want some decorative design. Check out Design and Make if you do not have an appropriate model in your, uh, you know, that came with your software. Uh, you can, there's other item, other places as well um you know ebay just be mindful of ebay you know uh when you're shopping and all and buying models and all you make sure you're using a reputable seller and stuff okay now i'm gonna assume that i'm just going to uh have a picture in uh this uh that i'm gonna use in here but i'm gonna be doing a kind of an inlay style um setup Meaning that I want an oval uh, on the front of the box that I'm going to have a picture of my dog in. And uh, I'm going to have some area for some text. And I'm going to use the back for a nice quote or something. Um, a lot of times, I mean, you can actually do a nice little quote or phrase or something underneath the pet name. or However you want to lay it out. This is all comes down to your imagination. But I want to I, I want to create a part that um, when it pockets out this and let me get the oval in here so uh, you know uh, we're all visual people so let's get the uh, oval in here it's going to be my window uh, for my image 
um, that I'm going to do. Now Maya is a fat 120 pound dog, so let me see if I I might need to stretch that. Hold the shift key down. I might need to stretch out that oval a little bit. <laughs> uh, I might be able to get that big old head in there. Uh, she's looking at me like what? All right, so this is going to be my oval area. Now, what I'm going to do when I said I'm going to do it kind of like almost like an inlay is uh, this is going to be a pocket cut. And in the bottom of that pocket and all, I'm going to, you know, it's going to be a flat cut pocket, but around the outer edge, I'm going to use a contrasting material. I'm going to use a contrasting material uh for um creating almost like a when that picture goes in and sits at the bottom of that pocket this next piece is going to come in over that picture and fit nicely in there and that's what's going to hold that picture in uh uh or plexiglass and all and we're going to use uh the inlay tool uh for this because i want to create uh a stepped uh type inlay because I do want a bit of an overlap around the edge. I'd like to have a nice little decorative uh, overlap on the edge. I don't want it to be right up to it. I want it to literally be like a cap going over a bottle, you know, type thing uh, and, and all. So let's go ahead and um, uh, if I am going to do an inlay, and I'm just going to simulate the, uh, the, the vector area. And also, let's offset this inward. Uh, and I do want the walls uh, to be a quarter of an inch uh, for this offset inward. And I don't want sharp corners. It's an oval. There's no sharp corners on it. I do want to uh, select the new, and I'm going to offset that inward. And so, uh, this uh, this uh, think of this center area as being the window where you know uh, that pet picture is. Okay. All right. Now, when my part, when this part gets uh, cut out, it's going to be out of a contrasting uh, piece of material, and um, it is going to overlap this outer area here uh, to um, kind of create like that overlap frame. And uh, bear with me; that that phone will stop ringing in a moment, um, possibly maybe all right there we go okay um, so that's gonna be our window now we're gonna come back to that when we get ready to create the tool pass but let's go ahead and get everything uh, laid out so I'm gonna go ahead and I want uh, to I'm gonna kind of lay out my area because I want to show you guys we always work with the draw circle tool uh, you know we hardly ever get to work with the draw text within a vector box and um, you know we do that when we're doing you know working with text on text it's a fabulous tool to use and all but I want to kind of show it off a little bit tonight <clears throat> so um, uh, for this I do not have to draw out a box to use that tool but I do I want to I'm kind of laying out my uh, area and things and so uh, for this here we're gonna have um, and I'll center everything up, make sure everything is nice and centered and stuff. We'll do that. We'll do the alignment. I'm just getting the, the parts and things on here. I'm going to assume that this is where my pet's name will be. Uh, you know, how high or how tall I want. You know, I want the name to, you know, it's, it's, it's my pet's name. I want it to be, I want it to kind of stand up. So it's going to be quite tall. Um, let's kind of give it just a little bit. Not much there. And I'm going to do a simple little uh, quote here. You know, you will be missed. Uh, you know, uh, no one fetched a ball like you did or whatever. You know, uh, we'll do something cutesy there uh, in a moment. Um, <clears throat> so now that we have this, let's go ahead and make sure that everything in its position is centered um, where I want. And I want to be sure that I'm not my material now, not my material, but this inner rectangle, that boundary that I drew, I want to be centered within it. That's my working area. So I want to select it last. Uh, the oval uh, was first, this last. And I'm going to go into the alignment tool and just make sure from the left and right that it is centered. And notice now it is. For my rectangle, 
uh, where the name's gonna go, uh, same thing. I'm gonna use that uh, first, use my inner boundary that I created last, and uh, center that up. So now my uh, part is, is centered, however it may be. Now, using the uh, draw text within a vector box, while that box is selected, when I open that tool, it's gonna put the dimensions it's going to put the dimensions uh, wonderful um, sorry uh, Dennis was just letting me know that uh, the sound is good uh, thank you for that Dennis it's always good to get the feedback to make sure that um, uh, that uh, everything is that I'm coming through clear uh, not too loud if I'm too low if you guys and girls cannot hear me and you've got your speakers on max let me know because my volume on the microphone is turned down uh, so I'm not too loud and yelling in your ear but if I'm too low let me know that as well now with this box selected it put in the dimensions the dimensions uh, for me uh, in here so now anything that I type in here is going to be restricted to that bounding box dimension, uh, which is this rectangle area here. And so um, <clears throat> my dog's name is Maya, and I most likely would do all capital letters uh, um, unless I was using a script or something like that. But this is gonna be a block type font. And um, this is what, you know, so I, uh, I'm gonna use all capital letters here. And I want to go into my font tool. Now, for you new guys and girls, uh, for you new guys and girls, uh, fonts and adding fonts and things um, uh, to your uh, programs, you know, we have websites like dafont.com, D A F O N T.com, dafont.com where you can find thousands of uh, wonderful fonts that you can download free for personal and business use uh, so it's, it's a wonderful source um, but you know uh, with that source and that ability to download and install fonts into our computer and then the software recognize it that means we end up with an abundant amount of fonts and a lot of times it's hard to choose from those fonts well I want to introduce you uh, new customers to wordmark.it. So uh, in a web browser, if I came in and typed in wordmark.it and hit enter, this takes me to a site where I could type in a name or a phrase or a word uh, and in this case, I'm going to actually type in the, what, the, the phrase that I'm going to be using, uh, the word that I'm using, Maya. And when I hit enter, it's going to show me that name Maya in all of my fonts that are currently installed on my computer. And so now at a glance, I can very easily look uh, through my fonts that are on my computer and ultimately uh, making uh, picking or choosing a font much simpler than trying to go through the list and uh, try one go back and try another one you know in that case like that um, now uh, I do like uh, you know I like the uh, Dinan uh, Denin we'll call it Denin I like that little uh, the way the letters look and stuff on that one so that will be a contender um, let's uh, scroll down and uh, see what else we've got uh, remember it's a we're all capital letters so I'm kind of focusing more so on the block style text more so than the thin or script styles text and things uh, so it looks a little bit more appropriate um, if I now one of my favorite fonts is the marketing script shadow font if I wanted kind of a drop shadow uh, in the name uh, if I was going to add some accent colors to the the text and stuff uh, I really like the marketing script shadow uh, font and that is that font is a, a font that can be downloaded all three of the marketing fonts can be downloaded from 
uh, make uh, not make uh from defont.com. Um, so you know, if I wanted that drop shadow effect, definitely uh, could use that. But again, I'm not looking for that script style. Um, all right, I believe I have uh, you know, I could I've got tons of fonts, so I don't want to I don't want to waste a lot of time picking a font. So um, I'm gonna go with the Danine Danine uh, Danine. Uh, so let's go back up to the D's. Get back up to those D's. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Danane font. And so that's the font when I'm in my Vetric program. That's the font now because it is installed on my computer. Uh, I can go through and get to the D's on my um, uh, font list and find that uh, Danine, Danine, we'll call it Danine font. And I want to be centered and I want normal margins around my text. Uh, but I would like to, uh, I'm going to look and see what it looks like just normal or if I stretch it horizontally so let's look at the uh, normal Maya there in this box again is just for reference purposes um, it's not uh, you know it's not going to be I'm not going to be carving that box in unless I do a raised te text effect then that would you know be appropriate and if I was doing a raised text effect then I would actually close this and reduce it in size just a little bit because it was a little bit too long Holding my shift key, so notice it shifts and sizes on both sides, uh, keeping it almost equidistant. And so uh, I'll go with that. And if I go back into that uh, Maya font and everything um, with my new outer perimeter, I clicked on it to put that new outer perimeter in there, uh, it would um, stretch that text. Notice that Maya is wanting to um, come in uh, to that old box. You see that kind of ghost scene. So on my new box here, it is um, the .8835. I can remember this one I wouldn't, so I'm just going to copy that. And I'm going to go back into that original Maya, and I'm going to come in here and paste that value in there uh, and click Apply so it'll reduce down to that size. The 0.8835 didn't change because I didn't change anything with the height, just the width. And so now I, you know, I could with, uh, if I wanted no margins, uh, you know, I could maximize to that box uh, dimensions. If I wanted wide margins, I could, you know, reduce the size. I'm gonna go with a normal margin because uh, that will be good. And I do have a small 16th inch end mill. So if I were to do a raised text effect, um, then uh, my little 16th inch end mill could fit in these areas, I believe. I don't know. But if not, my V bit will. Um, all right. So now I've got that. Uh, I've decided that uh, I will just so you and all can see the raised text effects uh, we'll show you the regular v carving too but since i'm going to do that then i don't want square corners i want a nice decorative internal corner and so i'm going to go back into the rectangle tool and i'm going to use an internal radius uh, quarter inch uh, radius is fine Whoop, too big uh, let's reduce that down to an eighth of an inch radius just to give me a nice uh, uh, let's go a little bit quarter was too big eighth of an inch was too big let's go uh, 1875 316 let's kind of split it <clears throat> uh, getting into a little of the tacky phase now so let's go just uh, 0 0.15 there we go <clears throat> we'll go with that so I'm changing the radius uh, just to, to like get the you know look that I want. And so that's going to be that uh, lower area. So okay, I've got my picture area. This is going to be my pocket cut. 
then my uh, inlay cut, uh, my part's gonna be inlaid. It's gonna have an opening in the middle of it and it's gonna fit right in here, trapping that picture and then it is gonna overlap using that step inlay. So we've got this here. Now, um, you know, this is a pet memorial. You, we can, you know, I'm gonna do, I've got my raised text here, but I am gonna do a nice little V carve, maybe something in script right below it. Um, just uh, using the regular text tool. A regular text tool, not the text within a vector box. And I'm just going to, I don't know, would you put it in quotes? Not really. It's, I mean, if it was a quote, you would, but not if you're saying it. Uh, so let's, um, um, I'm trying not to be too sad, right? You will be, uh, just. You know what would be an, what would be another phrase that's not too sad? Um, now I have to throw and fetch the ball myself. You know whatever. <laughs> that's terrible. Okay, so with this, uh, I do want a nice um, <clears throat> a nice decorative font. You know, a nice script looking font or something. Uh, and so uh, I do have a lot. My go to. You know, my your 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 ultimate fallback. Your default is the monotype Corsiva. It's a very elegant font to V carve with. But if you do have uh, fonts, you know, uh, other fonts that you have, um, uh, you know, uh, downloaded, sorry, I, I get tongue tied sometimes uh, that you've downloaded, absolutely go with them. Uh, this um, uh, Malaysia, Malaysian uh, Circa personal font is, um, oh, that's, yeah, it's personal use, I'm personal. Um, uh, it's got kind of a nice little curl to the text and everything. I, I get a little worried sometimes. Let's click apply. Let's click apply. And I'm going to go uh, half inch tall. And uh, I get I get a little worried sometimes with these type fonts because they're very thin. Very thin. Uh, and um, they tend to carve shallow. You know, I usually have to add an extra depth and stuff. Uh, looking at that now, uh, no, uh, not for my pet memorial. We're gonna go. Let's go with it. Let's let's just focus with a monotype Corsiva uh, for right now. And yeah, come on. Let's see here. Stand by. I do have a pretty decent script. Well, this is where uh, word market comes in handy, so I don't have to sit there and try to dig for it. I'm going to type in, you will be missed. Same thing I'm using in there. Hit enter. And now let's go down. Uh, so, ooh. The AR uh, decode looks nice. Um, you know, it's a single line font uh, mostly. So I'm going to come down and let's see here. It's a nice looking font, but though. I'm looking for my, uh, unfortunately, we can't sort it out like your script and all that stuff. Uh, you know, it's going to show you every font in alphabetical order. Um, all right, decent, elegant uh, Edwardian script. Uh, nice uh, looking for. I will have to add some depth to it so it cuts uh, out deep. It's very shallow, but that's going to be the one that I'm going with unless uh, I can see something within the next second of scrolling down. Um, Gershwin's script looks good too. Actually, I am gonna Gershwin script is gonna be the one. So let's go in there and let's use that. I, I like that. It's kind of got a little bit of a boldness to it. And so let's hit the G on our keyboard and come down and grab that. I will just in case it does have a bold feature, I will click that and apply that in. And yeah, let's uh, size it down appropriately. Okay. 
and now we gotta look and see where we gotta get some space from I'm like oh he's changing his mind no I just want to compare real quick no nope. I like it it this is more this is more yeah miles Maya is a classy girl so she's gonna get some classy text all right so I'm gonna take this and just kind of give it a little bit of a bump up um, not too much you know I want to kind of be right where I am but I want to I also want to provide a little bit of I don't want to be cutting at the bottom so I want to provide a little bit of clearance from the bottom to my text and uh, it should have went in center but let's make sure oh wrong one uh, with it selected grab my uh, outside rectangle or my referencing rectangle should I call it and make sure it's centered it is a little bit of a movement there now this font ladies and gentlemen has overlapping lines we cannot have the overlapping lines inside uh, or these big loops these curly loops here we can't have these inside our vectors we have to clean them up so we're gonna take a second and we're gonna go in to the uh, trans uh, convert to curves uh, convert to curves we got we have to take this text and convert it to a curved object so that we can come in and work with and clean up our fonts our overlaps I've got a little loop there and I've got these overlaps I got to deal with now um, with our scissor tool interactive trim tool we can come in here and we can absolutely trim away these loops uh, and everything uh, you know to get rid of our overlaps if any we got a loop here you know we can get rid of those uh, very easily with our trim tool and go through but we can also <clears throat> use our weld tool uh, now I will have to use my scissor tool my interactive trim tool to trim away these large loops here and uh, let's while I've got it open let's go ahead and make sure that uh, you know these big loops uh, I will get rid of them any loops all right now I'm going to use for the rest of this text uh, we did you with the interactive trim tool but now I'm going to work with the rest of the text by uh, using the weld tool we're going to weld it together so I'm going to hold down my shift key because I'm selecting more than one item and uh, the letter the, the word B is not uh, posing any problems uh, we have uh, and notice that I'm only selecting the outside boundaries not the inside because the inside aren't overlapping anything right it's only the outside boundaries of the text that are overlapping one another and with those uh, text selected now I can weld under the edit objects menu I can weld those together to remove those overlaps okay so now we have our text and one of the things I like to do is because we did convert this to a curve it's all they're all broken up and stuff uh, once I do all my cleanup that I needed to do uh, I like to go ahead and reselect it and group it back together. So that way it's just a simple click, you know, when I'm selecting things. All right, so that's my front. Well, let's get into the uh, toolpath for this. Uh, we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll uh, see if we, there's a quote or something we want to put in here. Or hell, it could be a, uh, uh, I don't know. What do, you, uh, what do you do for a pet memorial? Um, I don't know. It could be something. It could be like a, a piece of her collar or something. I'm not sure. We can do something on the back. We can figure out uh, what we want. But let's focus on the front here. I want to go ahead and I'm going to switch over to the toolpath uh, tab. And let's, uh, I want to save the inlay for last. So let's do the the, the, uh, the uh, carving here and uh, for the uh, raised text and the V-carve. Now, this text is very small. These lines are very close together. So it's gonna be a very shallow cut. So I do have to add some depth, uh, uh, start depth when I create this toolpath. So I will be creating this toolpath separately from the rest. And that will be a V-carve toolpath that I'm using. 
and I want a start depth of, I'm gonna give it an extra additional um, 15 thousandths. 15 thousandths. And I am gonna use my 60 degree V bit. Um, uh, for this, for the tool, if you uh, not using, if you're not using that 60 degree V bit, hit select open up your tool database and choose the appropriate tool that you want to use whether it's out of your bit set uh, whether it's uh, you know out of your v-bit list which is for me down below here whatever the case may be but I am using my 60 degree v-bit um, and I'm going to calculate that toolpath now someone just asked me someone just asked me if the B is overlapping too and guys we're gonna take a break here in about uh, 15 minutes uh, 10 minutes and we're gonna go over some of your questions so keep putting those questions in there we're gonna go over them. Um, but uh, they asked me is the B overlapping too and they are exactly right looky there good eye uh, we have an overlap here on our lines on our B and uh, let's double check while we're here and let's make sure nothing else is uh, uh, screwy. Ah, I got a loop there and there on the D. So, <clears throat> good call uh, on that, uh, Paul. I appreciate it. And uh, we're going to ungroup that uh, for a quick moment. We're going to use our scissor tool uh, because we can just come in here and zoom in. Always zoom in so you get right up there so you can see what you're cutting and everything. Uh, notice that uh, when I cut this, my lines did not uh, you know, close off properly or did not trim up to that point. Well, when I close that tool, <clears throat> it's set to uh, bring those endpoints together. So it will close them off automatically. Um, so that takes care of the B. Now back with my scissor tool again, uh, let's go in here and let's remove the loops on the D. Now, when you're trying to cut something and you're sitting there and you're over and you're click 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 and nothing's happening why isn't that loop going away it's because there is nothing it's not intersecting anything that loop if i close the tool and click on it it's isolated by itself it's not connected to the vectors below it so there were no intersecting lines to trim to so to get rid of this, we simply select it and delete it. Click delete on the keyboard to get rid of it. All right, so um, now that Paul has uh, corrected me and got me back on track, uh, I'm double checking everything here. Now we can go ahead and once again, we can reselect this and group it back together. And I'm gonna go back into that V card because I just made changes and I'm going to recalculate that toolpath. All right, so. If we preview the uh, selected toolpath, I'm gonna to use no color on there so we can see it in its full uh, glory. Um, we got our carving and we can see that, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a very shallow carving uh, in itself. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a very shallow carving. Now, um, I did add that 0.15, you know, for this size. Let's take no flat depth or no start depth. Let's take zero start depth and calculate this again because that 0.15 might be a little bit too much for this close text. And let's reset it back to a blank board and let's preview that again with no start depth. <clears throat> and let's turn the color off. And uh, slightly better look, right? Uh, it's a nicer look, uh, not so kind of boldish. So uh, that tells me that I, because I do want to start depth, this is just going to be too shallow. Um, but it tells me that 0.15 is just a little much, a little much. So. I'm gonna back that off to a point oh six. Might as well finish it off. A sixteenth of an inch. Uh right? Point oh oh no no. What am I doing? What am I doing? 
Um, that was almost a major disaster. 0.015 was uh, too much. If I would have went 0.06, that would have been way too much. So we want to kind of break that down. I'm going to go uh, 0.008. 008 and recalculate that. <laughs> I almost uh, <laughs> almost carved too deep. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, hit uh, Preview Selected Toolpath. Let it go through and give it just a little bit more definition. Again, I do have that brown turned on. Let's turn that off. Uh, and uh, there we go. That looks appropriate. Now let's go in and focus on Maya with the background. Remember I said we're doing raised. We're going to do a little raised design. Uh, in this case, uh, something like this, the shallower the better. Don't go deep, you know, quarter inch and all that stuff. You know, sixteenth, eighth of an inch, a nice subtle uh, raise on this. So we want to select both our text and our boundary. We want to go into our V Carve toolpath, and we're going to set a flat depth. Anytime you surround your design uh, with a boundary and you're V carving, you want to choose a flat depth because uh, it's gonna carve really deep between these lines. Remember, a V-carved toolpath, if you're not aware, cuts between the lines normally, just like it cut between the lines of you will be missed. Well, I added, by adding this border in there, I added a new line, so it's cutting between the border and the outside of the letters. And that wide space would call for a deep cut, so we definitely wanna set a flat depth. And I'm, I am gonna do a small, shallow, eighth-inch flat depth. Now, if you uh, you know if you have just general tools in your uh, tool database and stuff, and in in your arsenal of tools, your little uh, CNC toolbox that you've got, um, if uh, if all you have is a V bit, then V carve it. Then the V carve is just going to do all the flat depth. It's going to flatten it all out and stuff uh, to the best of its ability. But if you do have a couple of bits, you know, in your arsenal of tools uh, that you can use wonderful now for me I do have a 16th inch end mill a flat bit a 16th inch diameter and so uh, since this is such a small area that's what I want to choose I want to come in and choose my 16th inch diameter end mill and um, click OK that end mill is small enough that it will fit in a lot of these areas to get close to the letters and stuff uh, but so the v-bit doesn't have to do a lot of cleanup uh, so with those two things uh, zero start depth eighth of an inch flat depth my 60 degree v-bit and my 16th inch end mill I'm going to calculate this And now if we look at this toolpath, and that's a great question, um, Peter Hearn. Uh, give me a minute, we're gonna, after we, after we um, create this uh, toolpath here, uh, I'm gonna answer questions and I will definitely answer that question. Um, with this, you can see this uh, unique look. Uh, all of these areas are getting pocketed out. Well, let's turn off the V-car part of it so that 16th inch end mill is going to be able to flatten out these areas here uh, which means it could not fit up around uh, the letters and everything and all so my v bit is going to do that so let's go ahead and uh, preview they're both selected now uh, when you see a toolpath you can see the blue and red lines this is called a visible Toolpath. It means that there are our toolpath and our toolpath list over here is checked. And so when it's checked, it's a visible toolpath. So we can use this button here to preview the visible toolpath. So we can see both of them at one time. And um, and you can see that I didn't leave a whole lot of margin around my border on the top and bottom my text is actually kind of cutting into it especially at that eighth of an inch cut depth right well let's take a look and see what a sixteenth of an inch would look like because I you know again it's a small little raise is what I want oops too many decimal points and if I calculate that toolpath and I'm gonna reset the preview and I'm gonna preview that visible toolpath one more time uh, we'll see that um, you know with that shallower cut we're not quite so 
up around our letters and all our border we're not on it and um, you know it's a nice you know uh, decent uh, depth of carve well notice that my tool marks for the most part besides inside the a the y and the m which I is, is, is expected for the most part uh, my uh, 16th inch end mill got a lot of that area flattened out uh, except for below the text and above it so me aesthetically uh, you know and again this is an exaggeration the v-bit actually does a, a decent job of flattening those areas out and things uh, but the software's got to show you where those tool paths and stuff are but what that for me how I look at or how I approach my designs is I'm going to um, give myself a little extra room on the top and bottom so I'm going to hold down my shift key and just grab this top node here and slightly pull it up a little bit and uh, give myself a little bit of extra room there. And I'm going to recalculate by double clicking and opening the toolpath up and recalculate this toolpath. Now, if I come in and preview the selected toolpath, or the visible, sorry, the visible toolpath, All right, we can see for the most part uh, it's gotten that and just below the text uh, barely got in there. It just uh, lives a little low and right on where the A humps up that it, uh, it um, you know, didn't quite, uh, so the V-bit had to clean it up. Now again, I could go in there and I could resize a little bit bigger, but I don't, I don't want to uh, make it too big, you know what I mean? Uh, when this is uh, uh, decorated in sorts, um, I, I, you know, I don't want it to be too big. So this little bit of area that the V-bit has to clean up is fine for me. Um, I don't want it to be too wide apart, and it kind of they not relate to each other, the two vectors or the two objects. Okay, <clears throat> so that's good. Now, if we preview uh, all the toolpaths so far, we've only created two. Uh, you guys are like moving along, Lenny. By the way, uh, don't hesitate to uh, type in there and give me feedback in the window, the chat window. If you're typing in the chat window, Lenny, you're too slow. Speak, speed it up. We get it. We got it. Whatever. You know, if, if the pace is good, then give me a, you know, hey, attaboy. <laughs> uh, what have you. Um, we're going to preview all the tool paths now because we do have that little Maya V card at the bottom. And, um, you know, we would have our bottom of our box. It would look something like this. Okay, now let's talk about our inlay, uh, guys and girls. Let's talk about our inlay here. Uh, this center uh, vector is my window. Okay, you, let's, let's, we're going to be using, we're going to be using the outside vector. We're going to be using the outside vector for creating the male and female part of the inlay. Uh, on that male part of the inlay, when we create it, we are going to be cutting away the inside center because this is the window area. Um, but I'm, I've got a distance of about a quarter of an inch here that I want. So let's go into that inlay toolpath. Um, we're going to go into the inlay toolpath. And the step uh, inlay, I'm going to illustrate this. to the best of my ability. And I'm gonna weld those two pieces together. When it creates the inlay, it creates this stepped uh, look and all. And um, it, it creates uh, an overlap and all. Well, the uh, what this is uh, generally for is uh, whether you're doing a, a, a whole uh, type inlay uh, or you're doing a um, pocket type inlay, it kind of gives a little bit of a raised effect, you know, to that inlay. It's not flush with the top. It kind of overlaps, you know, that uh, that area. And now, for me, um, I this is the part here that is going to be cutting out and um, 
I got to figure out now, do I want to use a step in lay because I really want the step on the outside, right? That's kind of the appropriate place where I want it. Uh, uh, I don't really necessarily need it on the inside. But if I look back at my design, and let's just for kicks and giggles here, let's come in and let's say that that step is right in here and let's kind of rotate it, you know, and let's get it centered. So what this tells me is, is if I use this instead of a single vector, if I use these two vectors here, um, then, and I create that step, it's gonna give me a little overlay on the, uh, you know, over the window area, and then the overlay on the, uh, you know, outside area. And of course, uh, guys and girls, uh, this would be like right up to the edges, uh, so it's gonna overlap, you know, uh, a good, I'm trying to, come on now. Now I'm distorting it. But um, you get the picture. It's going to fill in right in this area, and that's 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 okay, uh, because I I want a nice little decorative edge and things. So what I'm going to do is undo or delete that uh, piece. But a step pad creates this little lip uh, versus a straight pocket inlay that just uh, you know straight just comes right in. All right, let's see if this works out the way I want it to. Um, I am going to do a stepped inlay. And the cutting depth, well, first of all, let's actually uh, create the female first. I like creating the female first. Well, I mean, I cut the male first uh, because the female I cut last um, because I can always offset or size that female to fit. But I want to see, uh, I'm gonna, let's do the female because I want to see if I use the two vectors that I've created to create that pocket. Uh, and I'm going to go down, uh, that pocket's going to be a depth of a quarter of an inch. Quarter of an inch. And I'm going to use my quarter inch end mill. I, th I believe I have enough room uh, for that quarter inch end mill. And... Calculate. Okay. And let's preview that selected toolpath. Okay. So this is going to be my inlay area. Now, again, remember what I said. Um, this uh, is my window. My picture is going to be here. So all this has to be gone too. But right now, is, that's going to be a pocket cut. We're going to clean that out with a pocket cut. But I want to create that that male part. And I want to see how much of an overlap it's going to create. We're going to, we're going to copy these vectors and move them over just for a minute. I want to see how much of an uh, overlap that creates. Because I may... Um, I may not like that, uh, and I may have to just be stuck with a, a traditional inlay, whatever the case may be. But let's uh, let's take a look. So let's go back into our 2D view, and I'm just going to double click on these while they're. Oops, uh, let's try that again. Double click on them while they're selected in transform mode. Hold down your control key, and I can drag a copy off. And I'm going to go ahead and drag this copy into uh, the other window. And I'm going to create my male stepped inlay. This actually might not look too bad. Um, cut depth 0.25 quarter inch end mill. Now, how deep do I want the step? And how wide do I want the step? Well, I definitely need the step to be a quarter of an inch. Uh, deep because that's how deep my pocket is and my step width how much of an overlap do I want uh, a little more than an eighth of an inch uh, eighth of an inch is a little shallow so I'm gonna go doom, doom, doom. not much more go 
go three sixteenths. Um, And I'm going to calculate that. My step depth is ah, because I have two, I have two uh, decimal points in there. No. Nope. Okay, so we can't go right up to quarter of an inch. Uh, I don't want to leave too much room because this is kind of going in and trapping my picture. Dum -dum -dum. So let's go uh, point two. Oh, come on. The step depth must be less than the cut depth for the complete inlay. Oh, duh. I changed the wrong... Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, Laney. All right, so step to this point two. Let's calculate that out now. All right, please ensure that the gap between all the vectors is greater than the diameter of the tool for the male and female inlays. Also, check that the tool fits inside all the female pockets to um, without creating islands. Uh, check toolpath carefully to ensure our results are correct. So we will click OK. All right. So you see what happened here. That's incorrect. Yeah. That's incorrect. I only need one vector. Um, oops. Okay. I only need one vector. We'll use the outside one. That's the most important one. Uh, let's go back into that stepped inlay and let's click on that outside vector and calculate. I'm stumped for a second here. I'm trying. Let's turn that color off. It's throwing me off. Um, I got to figure out which part is the actual inlay. There's my okay. So this is my quarter of an inch, point two, point two depth, and this should be my lip. Will Johnny be good? That uh, in order for that to work for me, I have to offset out this outside vector because that's cutting in here, and it's not going to fit within my pocket. Why? Oh, why would I do that? I wouldn't. All right. So let's fix that real quick. Uh, my distance uh, between the two when I offset them earlier was a quarter of an inch. Uh, so then I want to offset this one outward a quarter of an inch. For my mill. And I want to recreate that uh, tool path. Oops. Mm -hmm. 
Now, by doing that, if I take and let's come in here and go into our solid fill. This is where that bit is cutting. It's not going to show me that step and everything. I got to kind of be focusing on that uh, the inlay. So this is the part that's going to go in my original oval. And this is going to be the, uh, let's turn that toolpath off so you can see it. And let's turn the color off so you can see it. So there's my little step <clears throat> and uh, this is the center part that's going to fit inside my oval over here. Let's create that, uh, let's preview all the tool paths. And what that means is, is on this inlay, the uh, pocket inlay, I do not need this inside vector. The way it's cutting, I just need the outside vector selected. All right. Yeah, that's more. 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 Ooh. That looks so big. <laughs> All right, let's see here. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'm going to watch what I say. All right. There's the pocket. You're not fitting that piece in there, so let's go back now. All right, let's delete that. Let's go in there on that stepped inlay, and let's create that inlay back uh, where we are. Okay, all right, that's more appropriate. Okay, I when I a moment ago, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when I said to offset this out a quarter of an inch, do not. Uh, the toolpath actually calculated correctly, but my uh, my vision of uh, it was uh, not correct. Okay, so this is perfect. What this means is is that that this piece here that gets cut out uh, when uh, cutting through the material let me let's let's create let's view all the tool paths this is perfect watch me go uh, preview all the tool paths uh, took me a minute uh, to get my head wrap my head around it for a second all right so our female pocket area our inlay uh, the male pocket is going to create that male inlay that fits right in there. And then it also creates the overlap. Uh, that's awesome uh, because now my overlap is going to only be on the outside border. And I can cut that part out whoosht, out of a contrasting piece of material uh, somewhere on my table. i got a, you know an area where I can move over and cut out that part. I can then insert that part into this opening and I can do my final pocket cut on the inside area I can do my final pocket cut to a quarter of an inch deep even really point to anything beyond point two is fine um, I can calculate that when that new piece is in there and uh, cut out that center and create my little rim and everything. So, okay. Let's uh, see if I can illustrate this uh, for you. We're going to draw, oops, not in this window, we're not. We're going to draw a rectangle. This is going to be a side view of our oval, okay? Um, when this whole area gets pocketed out, our next inlay uh, is going to literally um, fill that area completely and it's going to 
Let me reduce this down because it's only an eighth of an inch lip and it's only a point two. So hopefully our picture is thick. We'll put a backer behind it. But it's also going to create that overlap around the whole part. And let me weld these two parts together. This one and this one. Weld. All right. And let me weld. Uh, no. Idiot, don't weld, don't weld. Um, this outer rectangle here needs to go up there, then weld them together. Oh, I had every, hold on a second. Um, And we will just move this up. And then weld those together. I'll get it here in a moment. Uh, this one's a little funky. Hold on a second. Don't weld yet. Okay. So. My inlay when this uh, from this side view when this all gets pocketed out my Mel inlay is going to come in and gonna fit in there uh, give me that lip all the way around the oval and then I can go in uh, in the center uh, oval there and I can pocket that out that center oval you gotta work with me and pretend that it's all centered there guys and girls Oops. And my that'll be my view and I'll have this ring all the way around exactly how I wanted it, you know, and everything. So uh mind you everything wasn't centered when I cut and trimmed this, but you kind of get hopefully you get the idea of what's going to happen here. So, awesome blossom. That's exactly what I wanted. And so let's get rid of this uh and let's do this appropriately. So we're gonna take uh, these two vectors here and we're gonna make a copy of them to a new layer. And we're gonna call this layer our Mel inlay. Okay. And that uh, Mel inlay is gonna be cut out of a contrasting piece of material. Um, so we can create a toolpath on it in a moment but I've got my female inlay which is the pocket inlay right here uh, perfect uh, to that depth of a quarter of an inch and uh, you know calculating it out it's gonna remove all that material BAM and uh, let's turn this off and let's get rid of the uh, color so it's gonna remove all that material now my Mel out of a contrasting piece is going to cut out it's going to cut out to the perfect size to slip right down inside there and along with this lip that's going to sit on top all the way around and then I can come through after I put those two parts together I can come through and do a pocket cut uh, in the center of this oval which would look something like this And that will give me my ring with my overlap that will snap right in there. And of course, this will be cut all the way out. We would be cutting through, uh, you know, the material, the cut depth. I only had it set to cut a quarter of an inch depth uh, and, and everything. Um, but we would do a profile cut and we would cut that out. Um, so there is our one style. Now. Um, let's go ahead while we're creating toolpaths let's create our profile cut every time you're pro you're doing a profile cut uh, whenever you're following a line you're either on the outside of the line the inside of the line 
or on the line. In this case, I'm cutting just a small little uh, 16th inch groove using my 60 degree V-bit. Hopefully that didn't make the step didn't make it too complicated. I apologize if it did. Uh, I want to be on the on the line here, and I want to just uh, cut this. And what this is going to do is just create a very shallow divider line for me, so I know where to take uh, to cut my two halves out and things. Um, if I wanted to, uh, I can create a divider. I can create another line here, and one on this side. Um, hell, I could do it on all in, in five different places here so I can show where to cut with on my table saw, um, you know, with my miter cuts and all that stuff. But I'm going to just leave it alone with just the center cut, the center line. Because um, then I will appropriately cut my pieces down. Okay, so let's get rid of this. Um, Earlier, you saw me create a uh, layer called Mel Inlay, and you're probably wondering why are you doing it again? Um, because I undid my actions uh, earlier, and um, which removed the everything that I did when I created that inlay. So I'm making a copy of this to the Mel Inlay. I'll use that uh, later when I'm creating that Mel Cut, but this is gonna be the front of my box. Now, back can be blank, Sides can be blank, um, however you want. But right now, uh, we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, I do not want to spend uh, any more hour on the back and all that. I want to start creating the top. I want to create the kind of, we're going to have a decorative, kind of a almost like a raised panel type top uh, made out of a solid piece for our box. Um, and... Uh, because this is going to get fitted in and, and glued in and all that stuff because you're going to be uh, you seal this completely when it's completely uh, um, assembled and you can have some access uh, screws on the bottom screwing that bottom plate on uh, in case for whatever reason you need to access uh, that iron and stuff but uh, everything else the lid's going to get sealed on completely so <clears throat> Let's uh, clean up ourselves here. Uh, we've got our uh, raised text, our little V carved text. We got our female pocket and our male inlay. We will create that in a moment. So I'm going to delete that for right now. Uh, this pocket cut was uh, can get deleted, and this profile cut is going to be my center line. So for right now, there's my vectors and we're going to uh, create our top so uh, I'm going to vcar pro 9 I'm right clicking on the little icon in here to open up a second instance because we're gonna make our top in a second board and I don't want to uh, lose anything now let's stop here this is it's 858 where we've been in uh, 45 minutes into it let's answer some questions okay um, Right, William. No Sharpe. Uh, you know, when you when we were looking at the animals and stuff, uh, you could absolutely try to Google uh, Sharpe and uh, see if anything comes up for you. Um, or you, if you just wanted a V carve versus a model type carving, you know, uh, you can find uh, line drawings of a Sharpe and you can definitely carve that in. Um, uh, once again, Dennis, thanks for the feedback on the sound. Uh, You'll have to, Dennis, you'll have to explain to me uh, the part about I can finally get new carpet. Oh, oh, about the lost pet, probably I can finally get new carpet. Um, Paul had asked what method uh, JB uses uh, to zoom in or out uh, the drawing box. And so uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, I wanted to pose that to the group. So uh, if you have a mouse with a roller wheel on it, 
the roller wheel is a great way to zoom in and out of a design. And if you put your mouse pointer on the area, the point of your mouse on the area you want to zoom into when you roll in, it will roll into that area. Okay? If I want to roll into or zoom into Maya and my mouse is way over here, guess where it's zooming into? Way over there where my mouse is. So uh, put your mouse in the area you want to move into and it will zoom into that area. Um, you also have your zoom box, uh, your 2D uh, view zoom box here, this first magnifying glass. And when it's turned on, your mouse is now a magnifying glass, meaning that if I draw a box around the area I want to zoom into, it will zoom into there. And if I click into that tool again, I can, you know, get more specific. Maybe I want to zoom into my M and I can work that method as well. Um, so uh, we can definitely use our zoom box uh, icon, you know, our first magnifying glass. Now, if you're in 8 or 8.5, that's still over here on the left first magnifying glass icon and all we can we can zoom in there so there are uh, quite a few ways uh, to uh, zoom in it just depends on what your needs are but if you put your mouse I want to zoom in on the E and the word B if you put your mouse on there it's gonna zoom in to where the point of that mouse is okay so be mindful of that if you're down here somewhere and you're just rolling your mouse guess what you're, it's like, well, where'd it go? Where'd it go? You know, kind of thing. Put your mouse where you want to zoom into. Uh, or just use your zoom box and draw box um, and everything, whichever way. So that was a good question, uh, Paul. I just wanted to uh, show that off in the, in the class. Um, checking out the uh, design and make website from Vell Woodworks, uh, how exactly does it work? Is it similar to importing and tracing uh, with bitmaps? No, uh, it's not. Uh, on the Design and Make website, when you go to uh, download, uh, wouldn't be a happy cat because they passed away, so let's try <laughs> a different cat here. When you go to uh, purchase and download, you have three different views or three different types of a file uh, that you can get. Uh, the regular, uh, it in a dish, which would probably be appropriate uh, if you were doing some type of burn email, unless you just wanted it to be standing off of that. But nice inside of a dish would be a nice option. Or inside of this kind of uh, textured outside card border. Um, when you download, it gives you options. It says choose your file type. STL, V3M, um, or uh, there's another one. And it's, it's, it's eluding me. Uh, I think EPS or something like that. Um, well, if it's a V3M, then it's going to go, when you download it and everything, inside of the clip art tab, you have a design and make folder. And that model is going to go right into that design and make folder. These are models and projects that I purchased from design and make. And so those V3M models will come in. And these act, the V3M act just like a clip art from my regular clip art. When I drag and drop, you know, uh, from my regular clip art, when I drag and drop a model in, you know, I can, you know, immediately go through to sizing it or doing whatever I want uh, and things, uh, you know, for that model. The same thing with the design and make. Uh, folder those files uh, when I come in they are drag and drop as well just like a v3m now if the model if the model is a uh, STL if you chose to use the STL you have to keep some things in mind one in Vetric VCarve Desktop Pro uh, and Pro, um, I believe Aspire as well. Uh, no, uh, for just Pro and Desktop. You can only bring in uh, to your design one STL per project. So if I was trying to build a design uh, or a project null, 
with the V3M model file, I can bring in as many files as I want in Pro or uh, Desktop. Um, but if I bring in an STL, let me get rid of these. That might be a good model for the back, a little rose or something. Uh, if I brought in an STL and imported that STL model that I purchased uh, from Design and Make, uh, let's see here if I, uh, I know I have STLs. Let me just go to where they are. <clears throat> where am I thinking here? Where am I thinking? I know they're here. Uh, pictures, that's where they are. Uh, took me a second. Pictures, uh, CNC camera roll. DXF, Aspire Designs. No, hold on now. Color clip art, clip art, black and white. Uh, STL models. There we go. All right. So on my STL models, let's grab one that's a little bit uh, um, rings. Uh, we'll bring that in and click open. Now, when I bring that in, it it goes in and says, okay, here's a new window. Orientate your model. Uh, your model might come in, you know, sideways. It could come in left. It could come in bottom and upside down. Well, you got to orientate it. I want mine to the top view, uh, the way it's orientated here. Now I need to size it appropriately. Uh, so I have to, you know, let's say I want to come in two inches and click apply and size it. And I want to center my model and bring it in. Make sure I want to bring it down. I want that model right on the top of that block above the zero plane line. So if I go into a Y view, you see this black line underneath this STL model. That is my zero plane. And I want the model above the zero plane. And so I would import that in. And now I have my, you know, my 3D model of my uh, overlapping rings. Well, the, uh, that's the only STL model that I can bring in. If I go to try to import another STL model, this version of the software only supports a single imported model. You already have a component which has been or imported from an external, external keyword 3D model to load multiple vetric.v3m clipart files um, uh, but only one, you can upload multiple Vetric V3M, but only one external file. So when you're purchasing from Design and Make, you're better off using the V3M file for your download when it says choose a file. Uh, the V3M option is going to uh, be the best option for you. Okay, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. All right. Hopefully that answered the question about um, models. Uh, the question that uh, uh, Vel had, um, uh, because it's not like tracing a bitmap. It's not like tracing a bitmap. You uh, import the model and it's ready to go. Or if it's an STL, you've got to orientate it, size it, and uh, you know uh, position it. All right, so I'm going to delete those uh, models, that model, and get back to our 2D view. Um, all right, so do you, Peter Hearn uh, earlier asked a question, do you like or use the vector validator? Well, I love the vector validator I think it's a great tool uh, when you have vectors in question uh, typically for me when I have a vector in question it's when I import a DXF file and so if I go back to my pictures and my uh, camera roll and my DXF files <clears throat> 
Uh, bum, 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 bum. We'll give it, we'll grab this one here. When I import a DXF file, especially one uh, similar, bear with me a second. Let me group that together. Uh, especially one that is as uh, complex as uh, this wheat here. Um, okay. I want to be absolutely sure that that vector, that there's no complications with it, right? And the vector validator tool under your edit objects uh, checks for potential issues with your vectors. So if I open this up and say, hey, let's uh, search the selected vectors, this one is chuck full of issues, okay? 183 zero length spans. Zero length spans are uh, nodes that have no uh, line in between them. They're just right on top of each other. And you will get that uh, icon with the square with a little zero on it. You see all these zeros on my screen. That's all of them, right? So I have a button here that I can fix those zero length spans. I can get rid of them, clean it up. Now that cleaned it up. Now I have 12 overlaps and 27 intersections. And that's going to be here where my lines overlap and intersect on this wheat here and so I need to clean those up and I have some down here uh, as well um, you know and this is a piece of trash this rectangle right here that's a speckle uh, pixel piece of trash and uh, you know it needs to be cleaned up the little plus sign is intersections and those intersections on this wheat here is basically if I close this tool um, and I ungroup this, uh, the intersections are where the two ends come together uh, for this. If I go into uh, node editing and uh, go into my node editing, typically where my start and my end point uh, come together uh, there, you know, there's an, a little bit of an overlap. Well, that is not going to be an issue for me. Um, it is, uh, it's, 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 the vector is closed. There's no overlap there, you know, there's no intersection or anything like that. Uh, this little overlap where these two lines, this end point and the beginning point where it comes together and closes itself off, uh, there's nothing really I can do to fix it. I mean, if I, if I right click and cut the vector there and I pull this down or up should I say up uh, I can rejoin I can rejoin uh, this uh, with a straight line uh, and close it off but if I stay in this area, if I, with it selected, if I go into the vector validator tool and search that selected, you see how it, it created a zero length span versus an overlap, right? It, uh, it created those two nodes are right next to each other, those two endpoints. Well, if I go and um, fix that, now I've created one intersection. Do you understand what I mean? So it's gonna be one or the other, intersection or zero length span where the two come together. So as a whole, as a whole on this design, when I search that selected and I get my overlaps, I know that once I come in and uh, clean up these where they actually are intersecting right here, that the lot of these uh, indicators here um, are where my two points are coming together uh, in things and overlapping uh, and stuff. 
uh, so an intersecting so they're not going to cause me any problem and all but I love the vector validator tool for uh, the fact that um, that it can help me you know point out those issues uh, otherwise you know I might be searching everywhere you know if, if an issue pops up going okay why is that doing that then I'm having to search for it and all well this is pointing me in the direction for searching now one thing I would love uh, to see on this tool which is hard to do you know it's hard to do because there's reasons for intersections there's reason for overlaps um, I if there was a way to cleanly do it without causing any complications to the designer losing anything you know I'd like to have a tool where I could also uh, clean up or fix the overlaps and the intersections here that'd be neat but sometimes uh, that might remove parts of my design that I don't want you know but the zero length spans definitely don't need them you know those are just issues to begin with so uh, to answer your question Peter yes I love it um, uh, I you don't see me use it a lot because I'm very aware of my uh, vectors and things that I, I work with and stuff and about anything new or anytime I'm importing a DXF or something I definitely validate it first to find out what the potential issues are with that DXF I will correct and clean up those issues and I will typically export that DXF out uh, you know cleaned up uh, and things and then I don't have to worry about it again but no it is a very wonderful addition to v9 and you should often often check that uh, use that okay uh, so hopefully Peter that answered your question um, let's see here how do you zoom in and out to a specific area in 3d as you review the toolpath cut well, that's a great question um, when you're in a 3d view when we're in our uh, preview mode and things um, to uh, this it's similar to when you're in 2d mode how do you zoom into a certain selection if we put our mouse over and we start to zoom in notice that it doesn't it doesn't go to that area it's it's that's the one difference that it's uh, you know it's it has nothing to do whether you're where your mouse is you know where it's zooming into it's just zooming in it's taking this image as a whatever's kind of front and center and when I zoom in it's just zooming in right to that point you know to get to an area I want to hold down my control key and my left mouse button and drag it over and then I can zoom in and focus in that area and if I need to see down below, hold down my control key and my left mouse button key and, key and drag up. And now I can zoom in further to that area. Now, if you have a roller wheel, that roller wheel acts like a uh, mouse button. And you don't have to hold the control key. You just push the button of that roller wheel. And now you can drag and pan it's called you can pan this 3d view around any way you want so if I needed to let's say I needed to zoom into this edge uh, I could zoom in notice that it's not going to that edge but I, if I hold down my uh, middle mouse button I can drag over to that area or if I don't have that luxury I can use my control key with the left mouse click uh, and I can it gives me the same effect okay so uh, if I'm just if I don't no control no nothing and just left mouse click I'm rotating I'm tilting you know I'm, I'm kind of uh, you know orbiting let's call it uh, the design um, but uh, when I zoom in it's gonna zoom into wherever it zooms into but then I hold my control key down and pull down to the area that I want to look at um, now in that 3d view uh, you do have these five icons up here at the top uh, when you're in the 3D view. So the first icon is going to bring your whole board into full screen view of this preview window. The X, uh, Z, uh, y, X, Z, X uh, button is your perspective view. So it's going to kind of tilt it to a little perspective view. Your uh, Z is straight on, face on, like, a, like an overhead top view. You've got an X view where you're looking down the X axis, 
right down the x-axis and then you got a y view like you're looking down the y-axis okay uh, so you have those icons there as well hopefully that answers your question about how to zoom into a specific area on the 3d view how to zoom in and I'm holding my control key as I'm panning over to that area how to zoom into a specific area now also keep something in mind as well guys and girls in your 3d view uh, you know when you're looking at toolpath um, you have up here in the toolpath menu you have uh, a preview simulation quality and for default it's set to standard so if I uh, previewed all my toolpaths in standard mode you see how absolutely pixelated that is uh, that view well I'm in standard view I'm working with less than a million pixels uh, to uh, you know do, to generate this preview image I want a view that gives me about a 98% representation of what my cuts gonna look like so if you are uh, in your preview simulation quality under the toolpath menu if you're in a uh, very high extremely high or maximum you know I usually typically default to the extremely high I'm in I've got a, uh, a, a very clean representation uh, of um, what my projects gonna look like the edges and everything so you see how much cleaner and clearer that is um, you know at a very high now what the what the numbers is of two times slower four times slower eight times slower and 25 times slower when it's actually generating generating this 3d view uh, it's going to be when you're in a very high mode it's more pixels more points so it's going to be four times slower to generate than if i was in a standard view my extremely high is eight times slower to generate this image than if i was in my standard view and then of course 25 times slower but looking at even a very high, if I go to the extremely high view and I preview uh, this image at an, a uh, very high view uh, and preview all the toolpaths, it's going to take much, much longer. You can see, I mean, just count down the seconds, much, much longer to preview this generate, to generate this preview image than it would if I was in a standard or a high view or something. But I keep it, typically keep mine defaulted in the uh, maximum height view. Um, and we got, uh, that should be the final one. And now if I zoom in and control key, left mouse click and pull over, let it uh, clean itself up. And all we've get, we're gonna get a much cleaner image uh, you know, we're at a 25 times higher view. So we're going to get a much cleaner image and things. Um, so your toolpath preview simula simulation quality, be sure to, uh, you know, set that appropriate for what you want. Okay. All right. But that's how you pan and click and, and move in and zoom into certain areas when you're in the toolpath view. All right. So let's um, go on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> so you should really just use the V3M instead of STL. William uh, Edlin, uh, based on my uh, uh, inf uh, conversation with, uh, or my, um, what information I just provided about Design and Make, uh, if I was purchasing a file from Design and Make, I would purchase the V3M uh, version of the file uh, because um, I usually I'm buying the little projects with multiples and all and it gives me the ability to bring in more than one model I don't have to bring it in as a whole model and only have limited you know limited uh, ways that I can adjust it and things so yeah uh, uh, you do not I, I don't say exclusively use the v3m there are purposes for using STLs uh, you know, if you buy a model on eBay or something and they don't have it in any other object or option than V3M, or if I created a model and provided it to you guys and girls, 
uh, you know, it's an STL model, so you can bring it in. I don't have a way of generating a vector, vetric, you know, 3D model. I have to create it as an STL file or an OBJ or, uh, you know, PRJ or so many others that you're able to import into your software. And so there's there's times and there's places and there's purposes for STLs and other model types. But the V3M, when you're buying from Design and Make, is the better choice of you know for you gives you the best benefits okay um, do you recommend updating the TNG software to the latest version well Debbie uh, yeah I, I, I honestly do uh, if you have the um, MK34 board um, the uh, update is a uh, it's an update to the CNC USB controller and in that they have uh, fixed a lot of things uh, a little a lot of bug fixes they have created a lot of wonderful uh, new uh, tools and stuff um, a lot of new con you know abilities to create your own controls and things when you know how to create the code <laughs> uh, and don't mess up creating those buttons but um, the algorithms in the software uh, have uh, made the machines run much smoother. Uh, the motors and things, they run much smoother and all during the operation. Uh, also, the um, when Windows updates, you no longer have to go back and reset your driver settings and all that stuff. All those bugs and everything have been you know taken out of the equation and all. So if uh, for me, uh, is it required? No, absolutely not. Stick with what you want to use. Uh, do I recommend it? Yes. If you have the MK3 board and the ability to upgrade to the TNG, I highly recommend it. Um, if you have the MK2 board, uh, do I recommend it? Well, that I, I always recommend keeping your equipment up to date uh, and things like that. Um, again, not required, absolutely not. Uh, but in order to update to the TNG, you have to update your board to the MK3 4 board. Uh, your MK2 you have to update, and that's a $275 upgrade kit. So um, uh, it kind of comes down to uh, that's I can't tell you uh, you know to go out there and spend $275. I'm not you know it's your money. You know you 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 have to make that decision yourself. Um, but uh, if you have the ability to uh, upgrade, then definitely do because there's a lot of benefits to it, and it's a really nice running program and stuff, and all. Um, okay. Uh, why is this project double sided? Well, uh, this project is double sided because other than doing a miter cut, we could be doing, um, we could be doing. Uh, joinery and things and uh, having the ability to, to jump over to the other side and draw in the joints and stuff uh, you know um, that's why it's double sided so it's a box and the box has two sides uh, you know to each side <laughs> front and back and two sides but it has an inside and outside uh, and so uh, for joinery and things if I'm doing dados and grooves now uh, I had mentioned that if you didn't have a table saw or a way to do miter cuts and all, that there would be a way that you could do miter cuts on the, uh, you know, uh, create or simulate a miter cut uh, in the software. And so let me show you that. Um, we'll show you that uh, here in a moment. Uh, let's see here. Let's make sure. Okay, so that, that, that was all the questions uh, that, I, that I had. So let's get back to the design. And uh, um, uh, Kim uh, posed the question, why is this a two-sided design? Why? why? What, was the, what would the purpose be? Um, well, the purpose uh, is, uh, you know, joinery. You know, how are we going to assemble this box together, these four sides? Now, we're only drawing the front and back right here. We still got to, you know, we would still have to create our two sides, which are basically going to be square, unless there's some kind of decorative design that you're wrapping all the way around. Um, we've got our top to create as well. That's why I opened up a second instance of the vector so we can start drawing the top. So I'll show you how to create those vectors. 
using the molding tool. We're gonna have a nice decorative molding around this, uh, you know, this piece. But why is it two-sided? Well, what if I did want this to be a mitered box, and uh, I don't have I don't have a table saw to do a miter cut in, or I don't have a jigsaw uh, to tilt my blade 45 degrees, or I don't have a bandsaw to tilt my blade 45 degrees to cut these miters. Uh, the only way I'm able to cut these miters is with my, you know, uh, my CNC. It's all I've got. So that's the simulation. That's the, that's what we would be. That's kind of the area we'd be working with. Why, you know, why would we want to do those minor cuts or how, not why, how would we do those, uh, those cuts? Well, uh, on my, uh, piece and things, uh, from here, um, I need to go ahead and let's, uh, create our, uh, cuts for our rectangle. So let's draw that out. And, um, while that's uh, there, uh, this is the, by the way, let's before, let me explain what I'm doing here first. I'm on the front side still. I'm going to draw, I'm using these uh, vectors to snap to. Uh, we could actually do it on the back side because you can actually snap to those vectors as well. Uh, but I'm drawing a rectangle to uh, highlight the area where I'm going to be creating my miter cut. And so we have, uh, this is one piece. All right, now in the second half, same, you know, the side here, we're gonna draw that rectangle. This is our boundary area. Now, we're doing joinery and everything, and if I go and leave these vectors at the length they are now, then my router bit's gonna stop at that pocket, right? It's gonna give me, you know, rounded edges and whatever the case may be. So on these four items that I just drew, I want to hold down my shift key and grab this middle box here and I wanna expand them beyond the box. I want my bit to be able to travel beyond the box and things. Now, uh, as I'm drawing this out to create a kind of like a fluting toolpath and all, Dennis uh, asked earlier, said, hey, uh, question mark, 90 degree V-bit to create the miter. Can we do that? You know, that kind of thing. Absolutely you could, you know. Um, the uh, Then you wouldn't draw the rectangle like I'm drawing. You would draw a line down the center line. Um, now that you have to understand there's there's an offset to it okay uh that v bit that 90 degree half inch head v bit i'm cutting three quarters of an inch deep and so uh the blade angles on that that 90 degree should be 45 and 45 uh, if not get a 45 degree v bit um but uh it's got a cut depth of about uh, cutting head about 0.2 inches and you have to remember that when it cuts that it's offsetting, right? That, that length of cut, that half of an inch. If I look at the span of this and I take a measurement on this span of this miter, let's do a, a horizontal measurement here. You know, it's three quarters of an inch. I have a half inch V-bit. So let's take a, let's, let's draw this out in a simulation here. Uh, let's uh, say that this is the side view of my board and I have a miter cut that I've got to uh, cut into it. And then I have my V-bit. Let me draw out my 45 and 45, 90 degree V-bit. And this V-bit has a half inch head. So let me make sure that my size is correct on this. Uh, I'm gonna measure horizontally from this point to this point. And that's 0.1873. Uh, we need to go wider. Bum, 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 bum. When it 
cheat and use my extend tool. And I'm going to use the extend tool to extend this to here, this to here. And let's take a measurement again. See how close I am. Point two five. So much bigger bit than my board. Let's actually draw it to scale because well, it's gonna you're gonna be like, well, hell, I can do that in one cut. Let's draw it to scale here real quick. Uh, rectangle. Uh, we're gonna go three quarter inches in height. Point seven five. Uh, and I'm just going to go four inches wide, click apply, and my V bit is, uh, we're going to draw a rectangle, is a half inch wide head, and the cutting depth on the 90 degree V bit, stand by real quick uh, so I can look at the cutting height of the 90 degree V bit. Um, Bum, 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 bum. Almost there. I'm doing this off camera for a minute. Video shop router bits. All right, that has a uh, half inch cutting depth. Half inch cutting, uh, that's a cutting diameter, sorry, half inch cutting diameter, a quarter inch point length. Quarter inch point length. So that V bit, that SC, or 1502, 90 degree V bit, has a quarter inch point length. Um, if I come up and use, I'm going to snap a line here and move up relative to its position, not size, move up relative to its position, a positive 0.25, create guide. And I can uh, delete this guide, I don't need it anymore. And from here, that was a quarter of an inch, point length. If I come in and uh, make sure my rectangle is still half inch wide. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, you son of a gun. Bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. Snap back to that. One more time, relative to its guide, 0.5, 0.5. Uh, or 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Okay. So if I draw out my lines from this point to the center, snap to that center, and oh, am I in the arc tool, you goofball? It's a line, not an arc. Um, let me snap back there one more time, find that center, and snap over here, and then straight up. On this side, space bar to finish. Straight up on this side, space bar to finish. I can get rid of that rectangle now. And that's my 90 degree half inch head V bit. Delete this guide. Delete this guide. So I've got a miter. Get my 45 degree there. Then I've got a cut. And let's kind of get in and focus on this. Oh, let's add this one to the mix. Add, uh, join those two vectors into one. <clears throat> so that way I can come in and move. So now, when this bit is cutting on this line, right? Uh, it's going to come over to the side of that bit and it's going to come and it's going to cut down to that cut depth. Then on that 90 degree V bit, 
uh, you know, it's cutting to that cut depth. Well, if I cut deeper than that, guess what happens? I get a straight groove on my miter cut, right? You know, we don't want that. So I have to create a second or a dividing line so that from this point here, my bit will step down to cut that angle. And then from there, it will step down and over and cut that angle to finish off that miter. So if I'm using a, a 90 degree half inch head V bit, I'm gonna have to draw my vectors a little differently uh, to create that cut. Okay, now alternatively, I can use an end mill with a fluting tool path uh, in a sense to create that as well. Um, so uh, you just have to, if I was looking, if I was looking to cut this here uh, with my V bit, there would be three lines of cutting, whatever that step over is, that distance from here to here. And then from here to here and from here to here, you know, I'd have to, you know, those three different uh, step overs to create those three different lines for this cutter to follow on the line where the center of the bit is cutting on that line. Well, I'm using a rectangle uh, and hopefully, uh, Dennis, hopefully that uh, illustrated and simulated under you where you understand what I'm referring to. Uh, when you asked the question about using a 90 degree V bit, we just have to draw our vectors separately so this bit uh, can cut in those uh, three uh, different points or areas, um, you know, and from here to here and from here to here to, you know, cut that, that miter. Now, I'm using a pocketing toolpath uh, to uh, create this miter and my bit, I'm going to use an end mill, uh, regular end mill, uh, to this and um, you know it's going to be using a fluting uh, type uh, you know uh, cut in a sense now we could absolutely um, you know we could absolutely try to do a profile cut where we're following the line uh, and you know we got a bunch of lines we could create real close together at different depths and all and things uh, but we do have the option of uh, doing a uh, fluting toolpath and uh, on this here, um, we can basically, uh, I should be able to, uh, and let's see how wrong or right I am. I should be able to go 0.75 uh, with my uh, quarter inch end mill. And I should be able to... Um, a linear ramp uh, let's see here this is gonna go depending on which way I'm cutting it's gonna be why is that tool showing a picture of a V bit bear with me a second here all right just making sure um, I, 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 I'm hooked on a feeling. Bear with me. I haven't done this in a while. Uh, calculate. Oops. Let's select a vector. I got. I got. I always got to see what a what a cut looks like. All right. So that's ramping the wrong direction. We don't want that. We want it to ramp the other direction. So what I need to do is uh, close that, reopen that back up. And <clears throat> I've got to create a series of lines. So bear with me a second. Let me do that. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to create my line from here to here. Let's 
spacebar to finish. Oops. Make sure that line is, uh, you know, where it needs to be. You go into node editing and back that bad boy up a little bit. There we go. All right. So now on this line, I'm going to create a row, uh, a quarter inch spacing apart and um, no columns. Or one column, should I say, but uh, let's see here. I need a quarter inch spacing apart and I'm going to need across this five and a half inch. I'm going to need 10 uh, copy. Oops, I went the wrong way. This needs to be a positive 10 number, not a negative on the Y. Uh, copy 10 is not going to do it. Um, ba -bum 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 -bum. Let's undo that. Let's go 15, uh, 25. Copy, that's good. All right, I can get rid of these two. Now, I either want my bit to go down, come back up, down, come back up, come down, come back up. Right now, my bit would come down or up, basically. I need to change the start, uh, you know, points. The start points are starting at the bottom of the cut and working its way up. I want to start at the top of my cut and work my way down but I want to alternate. So every other one of these, I'm going to right click, or going to node editing, not right click, but I want to uh, make that my start point. I want to reverse the direction. I want to alter, alternate, should I say, not alter, alternate um, these uh, two points. And there's a little bit more work involved if you're trying to do a miter cut on the, you know, the CNC and all, but it'll work. Uh, make start point, skip one, make start point, skip one, make start point. Okay. Now, if we look at all of these, I should, with them all selected, oh, you son of a gun, with them all selected, my start points should alternate. So my router's gonna go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. You know, and it's gonna be a little bit more optimized toolpath. Now, in that fluting toolpath, I want to uh, ramp over the entire length. Um, of that uh, cut and um, I want it to be a linear ramp. Now the ramp angle, right? Uh, at this point, if I were doing this now, could I use my V bit and ramp, you know, at that angle to where that bit that, oh, oh I lost my simulation. Um, I lost my little vectors and all where that bit was coming down and ramping at that angle, you know, uh, we'll find out. Let's use our end mill first and see what kind of cut we get. We're going to use a linear end mill. Uh, we are going to um, click uh, calculate. Oh, did I just create a, I just created a crisscross pattern, you goofball. Let's preview this. That, that's wrong. I believe it's wrong. <laughs> we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We want to ramp in one direction, not the other. I bet somebody was saying, Oh, Laney, you're about to screw up by alternating those vectors. Um, let's uh, control Z, control Z, control Z. Okay. Let's make sure they are all running in the same direction. Ha <laughs> ha! You goofball. All right. And, oh gosh, I really want to alternate them. Be mindful of how you draw your lines. Um, but anyway, that's fine. So we're going to uh, 
close. I do want to start at the bottom and ramp down. So let's, with my one, I'm going to go into node editing mode and I'm going to change that start direction to this end here. Make the uh, start point. Now I'm going to go into my linear array. Copy. Get rid of these two on the end here. Uh, if I go into my toolpath, um, all my start points should be there. Wonderful. Ramp over the entire length. Uh, I wish it gave me a ramp angle, um, but it doesn't. Ramp percentage and ramp length. Uh, but I think it ramps at a 45. I'm not sure. Let's find out. Let's reset that preview and preview that selected toolpath. Um, ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. oh, you nutball. Don't, um, don't space those, uh, a quarter inch apart. <laughs> Make your step over much tighter. Oh, Lord have mercy. Um, I'm going to go half the diameter of the bit. which means I need to double that. We'll get her here in a moment. We'll get her here in a moment. And one more time, calculate. Reset the preview, preview the selected tool path. Okay, still got the grooves and all. I might have to make a tighter step over. Let's take a look. Still got those grooves and all. That should be nice for glue hookup, but not nice for miter. Let's take a look at, just for kicks and giggles, let's get off of the, let's go with a V-bit, the 90 degree half inch head V-bit. And calculate that same cut. Somebody forgot to reset his preview. Okay. Yeah, so it's still uh, still showing those groove lines. Hmm. 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 I know somebody's. But we're still working on the face of this. We flipped the water. We flipped the board over. We're 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 talking about the miters, Paul, for a minute. We're we're on the back side of the board, uh, talking about the joinery. All right. So I need a flat cut. Why is that show rounded? That's what throws me off here. <clears throat> Okay, let me see something here. I think that's a vector gl vector glitch that it just can't show those end cuts. Uh, or it means that uh, I gotta tighten up my space. One more time, one more time, ladies and gentlemen. We gotta figure out what the deal is so we know we had to do it right. Let's go a And 
let's double that. All right, that's a hundred cuts. Why would we want to do that? I don't know, but let's, I'm curious now. Um, So, you'll get that miter cut, but it's, I don't know what these grooves are. Um, but we had to do, I mean, that's a hundred passes. That's a hundred lines. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. When, in fact, we should only, it's a half inch head, right? It's a half inch diameter head. We should, in fact, be able to space this, even if we went a quarter of an inch apart, uh, you know, we should be able to uh, space this um, I'm gonna go 0.375 I'm not gonna go the full half inch All right, we're getting we're, we're we're getting bogged down. We can't get bogged down. We got but we gotta we gotta know right. We gotta know V carb ninety half degree. Reset our preview. Yeah, see, our router sh something is hitting. Uh, when it's coming, it's not really doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Um, either that or it's not simulating properly. Uh, but I don't believe that would be the case. I think my shank, let's see here. So I should be using my end mill. Um. For this, uh, shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a V bit. It should be an end mill. But let me think on that one, guys, and let me face that. Post that in the Facebook group and just kind of see what we do. I got to do some simulating cutting for JB tonight uh, with the laser. I will run a fluting toolpath with both an end mill and a v bit and i'll post the pictures i'll post the pictures on facebook and see what we uh see what we see see what we come up with because um yeah that uh did not simulate right at all all right but alternatively uh you know we could miter cut at a table saw band saw scroll skill saw uh scroll saw uh jigsaw you know you have a lot of different options out there um and all but this is a two-sided part uh kimberly because uh if we wanted to simulate joinery i could flip it over and simulate it but that simulation didn't work very well uh but that's why i've got it set up as a two-sided part you would set it up as either a single or two-sided part if Single-sided part if you're only carving the front half of things. Uh, Double-sided part if you're putting your joinery in, your rabbit joints and things like that, like we did with the uh, um, the uh, Celtic picture frame and stuff. Okay, so let's see here. That posed a lot of questions. Does Whiteside manufacture the 1 16th inch end mill? Yes, Ron, they do. 
um, that uh, end mill. Um, no, I'm sorry, they don't. Uh, the 16th inch end mill is an Amana tool. It's an Amana tool. Um, but they, you know, there's there's other companies out there that, you know, that make 16th inch end mills. Um, the Amana tool. 16th inch end mill you can get as a plain end mill or a ZRN coated. And um, if any of you are um, curious, that uh, 16th inch diameter end mill is tool number 46. Two nine zero four six two nine zero a mana tool four six two nine zero. Um, it has a sixteenth inch diameter uh, end mill, um, flat bottom. It's got a five sixteenth uh, cutting depth with a quarter inch shank. Overall length is two inches long, quarter inch diameter shank. It is ZRN coated, so you can coat it in multiple uh, things, uh, multiple. Um, uh, materials, should I say. All right, guys, we're already 10 o'clock in and we, we haven't even created the lid. So let's real quick uh, demonstrate creating the lid. Uh, and so if my box uh, is eight uh, inches on the uh, length, you know, for the uh, part to get that six and a half by wide, all the way around, um, six and a half, six and a half, six and a half, six and a half, you know, all the way around. Um, <clears throat> that uh, then I'm, all four pieces are going to be the same. Well, what that does for me, let me switch this around and let me, this is my. Mitered piece here, G for component. And let me hold down my uh, move tool, M for move. Oh, did I freeze? Hopefully I didn't freeze on you. Let's make sure I didn't freeze up on you guys. Okay, M for move and hold down my control key. Uh, and I'm just going to drag a copy over to there. <clears throat> and I'm going to take my rotate tool and rotate that 90 degrees. And if I take my move tool. And let me get rid of these uh, guidelines real quick because they're just driving me nuts. Uh, delete. Delete. And let's pose this where y'all can see a little bit of a perspective. Um, all right. So let's take and move this. Control key and snap to that end and flip it. And one more time, we'll take this guy here and move him. Make a hold our control key, snap and flip him. Oops. And snap him in there. We've got the uh, box. And so my lid. Should be an eight by eight, right? Because uh, that's how long my boards are. Duh, duh, duh. But let's uh, be sure. Um, eight 
by eight. Okay, so I should have uh, known that, right? I should have known that. All right. Let's get back to our um, project. Okay, back to our vector. So we want a lid uh, eight. Now, am I going to be clamping and cutting this out? I'm going to go a little bit bigger. I'm going to go uh, nine by nine, not ninety-nine, nine. By nine sorry it uh Elude me there for oh you come on now, my mouse is dying so the uh, got to charge the battery. All right, so once again uh, this is going to be just a one-sided part, uh, so we'll set it up as a single-sided project. Mm. Yeah, single-sided project. I'm just going to glue it right to the top. Uh, we can have it with a lip on the bottom if we want it to fit inside that box kind of thing, but I'm just going to create a flat top or flat bottom. So we're going to work off the bottom left corner for me uh, and click OK. Now, I'm going to draw a rectangle. We're going to create a rectangle here. And I want to uh, also, uh, in the center area and stuff, I want to create a... Um, I want, to have, I want to end up with a nice little lip raised area here, but I want to offset this rectangle inward. Um, I'm going to go one inch, with sharp corners, and um, <clears throat> from there, I want to go in an additional from this new vector, I want to go in an additional three eighths. Okay. Now I'm going to create, we're going to be using the molding toolpath for this and uh, for this lid and everything. And so we're going to uh, create a profile. And the uh, profile, the first profile, because I went one inch from the edge. I want to draw a rectangle that is um, that is uh, one inch by a half inch, and I want to uh, go into node editing mode now because when we are drawing a profile, we only need these three lines. We do not need this bottom span. So we're gonna right click and delete that span. And for this profile, I'm gonna have, uh, it's going to uh, have about a, uh, a quarter inch uh, lip. And uh, we're going up to, you know, a three quarter inch uh, board. Um, and But my overall height right now is a half an inch. So I, it gives me a chance to raise up that extra quarter. Um, but I want to go and turn this into a busy curve and I want a bit of a just a small subtle ramp and I want a bead if I'm coming off the top of my piece and I'm coming down to my profile I want a bead right about here Ooh, not that big um, <laughs> let's go right about here and draw it not click and 
and I'm going to trim that so I kind of got it, you know, the visual there. And from that bead, I want to step down. So in node editing, I'm going to cut this vector, zoom in so you all can see it. I'm going to cut this vector here and I want to just use my down arrow key. Uh, oop, not on that one. On that one. I want to use my down arrow key. Bring that down. And I'm going to use my left arrow key and kind of bring it over. And from here, a CNC can't really do an undercut. You see that undercut right there? So I want to take this node and it's in line with this. So I want to turn this into a line and I want to pull that node in alignment with this one by hitting the uh, selecting this one first and this one second and hitting the letter X on my keyboard. Okay. Uh, to create my bead and then I want to arc a very small amount from here to here very small I want to make sure that I'm not creating an undercut of any sort and I'm going to join join these three vectors together into one now that uh, will give me an opportunity if I want to go into node editing mode I can adjust uh, you know um, things and I do I want to kind of uh, oops, I deleted that I want to kind of create a very subtle curve here all right so now from this this is going to go uh, from the bottom of the piece it's going to go a quarter of an inch it's going to come up and uh, this from here this node it's going to end up at the top of my three quarter inch piece so I want to draw a three quarter inch line space bar to finish and now I can cut this node here I'm gonna come back here also I want that to kind of come over. Now, I'm going to undo that. I want to come right, I want that right there. I want that right there, just like that. That's what I want my profile to look like. All right. So let's uh, get rid of, let's see if we've got any duplicates. We do. Let's get rid of uh, it. I have a duplicate vector. Oh, it's going to be hard to try to drag that, grab that one. Hold down my shift key and turn that off and delete. There we go. I had a duplicate vector that was on one on top of the other. Okay, molding toolpath. I want to use this outside profile uh, as my guide drive rail. I want to use this inside profile um, as my, uh, you know, uh, profile itself. I'm going to use a... Uh, oh gosh, I could probably get away with a quarter, but I'm going to use an eighth inch tapered ball nose bit. And I want to calculate this. Oops, I want square corners. I do not want round corners. I want to open it back up and go square corners and recalculate that. 
All right, so let's preview this toolpath. Okay. Now, on this, I want this, this is the profile I want, but I want it down lower in the model. I want, because I want to kind of, I'm building up to this center area here. I want the center area raised. So I need to go back into that sweat profile and I want a quarter of an inch. Uh, well, let's see here. This is three quarter. How much of a raise do I want? A quarter of an inch. Yep. Underneath. And so I want to recalculate that toolpath. I want to reset the preview and preview that selected toolpath. Okay, and um, that's going to create the uh, first layer of my lid. I could actually go a little bit lower. Uh, it depends on what I want this center to look like. So on this center uh, part here, I want to go with a 3 8 inch rectangle. Point three seven five. The reason why, because that line is offset three eighths of an inch from there. Um, I believe it was three eighths, right? Three eighths. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so I want to go three eighths by a quarter on the height, because that's that raised difference that I have. And on this, I want just a very uh, subtle. Uh, I want to delete that span. And on this, I literally want to delete this point. And I want to turn this arc into a, uh, or this line into an arc. And I want a very subtle curve up to that point. So now I go in and create another swept model. This time I'm using this profile uh, for the drive rail followed by this profile. And again, uh, my eighth inch ball nose bit should fit in there. And I do want to be at the top this time and I should be able to calculate this. Oops, I want square corners. Square corners. Calculate that. And I should be able to preview this selected toolpath here. And I'm running a little bit of a... Make sure that did check off square corners. Boy, oh boy, that don't look like square corners to me. Hold on a second now. Turn that off. Back on and calculate. All right. Am I getting a glitch? Am I getting a glitch? Is this a glitch? Hold on a second now, guys and girls. Um, maybe it is square corners. It's just showing as rounded. Uh, it should be square. They should be square. So the gap above the model, that's, that's good. That's good. That's good. And I want... To turn off square corners for a moment and then go back and turn it back on
Hmm. I wonder why it's giving me a rounded corner. I want a square corner. I'll have to uh, figure that out. But I'm going to have to, if that's, gonna, if that's what it's going to do for me, then I've got these little lip areas right here that I want to clean up. Um, and would I knock those down? Bear with me a second. Would I knock that down with an end mill? Very kissly. Kiss that edge right there. Um, quarter inch end mill should clean it up. Quarter inch end mill. Ball nose, ball nose. I'm just, instead of using the eighth inch end mill to, um, uh, cut this piece, I'm going to use my quarter inch and that should... Well, there's the square corners now, you son of a gun. <laughs> That's funny. Um, There we go. That's what I was looking for. I was wondering, it must have been like a little glitch. Uh, it always gets glitchy this time of night, right? Um, so this is going to be my lid, making sure that my piece is three quarters of an inch thick, which it's not. I thought it looked very thick, right? It looked fat. Uh, this needs to be seven five. Click OK. This will look more appropriate now. Uh, they was looking a little fat on that back end. Baby got back on that board. Okay. So, um, this would be my lid for my box. And let's turn off the color. Let's see if it makes it look a little bit, uh, you guys can see a little better. Um, and let's kind of uh, pull, hold down the control key, pull over to this corner, tilt it up a little bit so you can kind of see the whole thing. And so uh, this would be this would be the lid of my pattern. And uh, if you like the way this lid looks. Uh, and you want me to include uh, these two vectors, you know, which I would anyway when I when I provide the pro the the files for this, um, you know, just remember if you do use them, the big profile is for the outside, the little profile is for the inside. Okay, uh, sweat profiles and things. Just keep that in mind. Um, and so this lid will get sealed and glued on top of the uh, box and finish it off. Um, and back to our box. Now, as far as the sides go, uh, guys, unless you're doing uh, any um, decorative design, you know, floral design, because you can really texture this thing up. I mean, you could really go all the way around and get, you could be very... Uh, uh, plain with your design or you could be very eccentric or you could be you know what have you uh subtle should i say um and uh for me it would be uh something uh you know pretty much subtle uh if anything if i were to do anything in the back it would be uh something like you know some kind of pet poem or something you know that uh really resonated with me uh and my dog uh what have you 
But as far as the sides, they're just straight sides. I'm not putting any decoration or anything on them. So I would just, I would cut and miter them, you know, on my table saw. There's no need to bring them over to the CNC. You could, you could bring them over to the CNC and profile cut those squares out. Absolutely. Nobody's saying you can't. But, um, you know, or you could, if you were doing a longer board and doing all four parts, then of course you're going to cut them out, you know, all at one time. But right now I'm uh, doing the inlay. Now, as far as the bottom, it's just going to be a square base. I may... I may, me personally, I may go in uh, to a design like this and I want my base to not be flush with the box. I want it to have a little bit of a pedal stool around the box. Like if this is my box's pink line, then I would want my base coming out just a little bit beyond it like this. And if so, then I could create a nice little OG or curve or some kind of profile uh, so that my base has a little bit of a detail to it rather than being just a square block. I could round over the edges, you know, with a round over, whatever you want your base to look like. Um, you can be, you know, uh, you can make it look any way you want. Um, I will uh, create this um, urn for you guys. I will literally carve it and create it uh, with the inlay. And I will take photos of the you know the inlay pieces so you can see the T inlay and how it fits in and stuff, um, and um, you know just to show you how it comes together. Uh, and uh, I'll do that. I've got I've got to shoot some videos this week anyways for y'all, so I'll make that one of the videos. Um, I got a probing video I got to finish up tonight after I do JB's carvings, but this would be your lid, and you have two tool paths. Uh, uh, using different bits. Now that we have the square toolpath uh, working properly, the square edges, I'm going to, because I want to do this all in one bit, you know, without having to do a bit change. So I'm going to come back in and change this back to my tapered ball nose uh, bit. Oh, you son of a gun. Look at that thing. It went right back to those round corners. So I may have to use my quarter inch ball nose. Uh, it may it may do that because of just the way um, that is. So, okay, I'll have to do a tool change. Um, I'll look at that a little further. And, uh, yeah. All right. So we'll use, I'll do the tool change, but I will carve this. I'll show you what it looks like now and keep this in mind. I mean, look around if we were to, uh, Google image, uh, you know, pet urns, um, there are many different styles, many different designs. Uh, the last, uh, thing I want to say before I say good night to you is, uh, I want to scroll down and if you happen to have a spire, uh, this nice, curved uh, body style okay with a decorative lid is uh, very elegant and if you happen to have a spire um, however long your board is uh, let's say that my board was eight inches by um, and actually, I'm going to do, uh, try to do all four sides whenever I can. So 8 times 4 is 32 by uh, 5.5. I am going to take a line. I'm in Inspire now just to show, to demonstrate a uh, option here. I'm going to uh, take a line and draw it from that edge to that edge. Down here at this end, I'm going to draw another line from that corner to that corner. And I'm going to draw a rectangle. If I wake up these edges, I can draw a rectangle to those edges. Uh, that rectangle is going to be... Um, three quarters of an inch thick and 
Again, node editing, I'm going to delete this span. And it's going to be a, a Bezier curve. This is going to literally come down pretty close to the bottom. I want to make sure that I'm not right at the bottom. And this part is going to raise up. Language, Mary Beth. Okay. Now, if I take that profile and I go into the modeling tools, two rail sweep of um, the uh, Aspire, I can use the two guidelines as a selection and this profile. I can sweep that between the spans. Oh, you son of a gun. I drew the profile the wrong direction. Let me just change my guidelines. <laughs> uh, let's delete that one. Delete that one. I always do that. Guidelines from this corner to this corner. Bam. Space bar to finish. From this corner to this corner. Space bar to finish. Delete that previous model. And grab this line. Hold down the shift key. Grab this line. That will be my drive rails. My profile, oops, lock in guys. My mouse is dying, so it's not let, it's not accepting the clicks. Um, I can sweep that profile along. There go. To create that profiled body, and I can machine that out. Um, and then do my miter cuts and everything to create that nice curved body. And then, of course, you would have your decorative lid. So if you have Aspire and you have the ability to create models, uh, those contoured cuts and things, and you can use a large diameter end mill for this. It's just a sweeping curve. Um, you can use a large diameter end mill to create those nice curved boxes. Uh, the one thing you want to check is make sure the model, after you draw it all out and everything, make sure that it um, doesn't give you an error. And if it does, then settle it up a little bit by bringing it down to your size of wood. Because I exceeded my size of wood with that big old hump right there. And <clears throat> on this model that I've created... I want to give it a little bit more base height underneath. Not 0, 0.25, laying 25.25. A um, little bit of base height underneath. And my shape height, if I'm doing this, I need a 1 inch board. Well, I'm going to reduce my shape height. Ah. Let it regenerate to create that curved body piece. Now I will miter cut that, uh, you know, cut it down to size, you know, mill it first, you know, of course, <laughs> mill it first. Your 3D finish cut, uh, cut that down to size and create that contoured um, part. Uh, you know, for your uh, 
for your boxes. You can create that nice, you know, subtle and however subtle you want to be with the curve and everything and all you can be extreme, but you can, you know, get a little bit more decorative than just square sides and things like that. If you have that ability uh, to create, you know, uh, those type of curves and stuff and all in there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can also do this with your desktop or pro using the molding tool path. Uh, you would draw one line and you would draw your curve just like we created the molding. Oops. You know, uh, in our 2D view, how we created the molding, we had our boxes were what we were framing. Well, in that case, on that long linear piece, we would draw a line. We would create our curve and we could still use that molding tool path to create that curved part. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> how it grows. What you just saw me do in Aspire, uh, the two rail sweep method cannot be done in Desktop or Pro. That is a feature of uh, Aspire. For those individuals, uh, we do have uh, customers that have Aspire, so I have to, you know, showing them. And I, I mentioned that uh, at the beginning of the video that I was going to be showing that. But this absolutely can be done in Pro or Desktop. Um, let's uh, demonstrate it real quick so you can see that I'm not fibbing you. It can be done. <clears throat> All right, we're going to create another file. Uh, I'll go 24 by 5.5 by 3 quarters. I will take my line tool and draw a single line across the top of the board. And then I will come in and draw a rectangle. Uh, this is going to have a uh, five and a half inches. Width of. Delete the, go into node editing mode, delete the span. Ah, I'm an idiot. Hold on. Do not go five and a half inches, uh, guys and girls. Three quarters, three quarters. <laughs> oh, boy, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought I was drawing the box again. Um, <clears throat> all right, three quarters by 24. There we go. Lord of mercy. That would have been a disaster. All right, we're going to delete that span, turn this line into a busy curve. We will uh, pull this up. Whatever that arc is going to be in the molding tool path. Um, we're going to select our line, hold down our shift key, and select our piece. Now, that is running 24 inches that way, not along the length, right? We don't want that. Um, I want, if that's the case, then this only needs to be five and a half, this profile here only needs to be five and a half inches wide, not 32 or not 24 like I have. So let me resize this uh, to. Um, let me close this tool so I can work with one tool at a time. This only needs to be five and a half by three quarter. Adjust my curve. Look, still looks good. Once again, in the molding tool path, we're going to click on this here and we're going to hold down our shift key and grab this. Uh, those lines you do not want them extending past or beyond, beyond, you know, your part and everything. 
Uh, so if uh, I'm going to use a quarter inch ball nose, half inch ball nose, we'll calculate this tool path. Um, if I look at this along the uh, X view, you can see that cut, you know, that it's going to cut. If I preview that selected tool path, Turn the color off. Um, so again, now this is in pro or desktop with the molding toolpath, you can acquire, accomplish the same thing. Okay. Now with Aspire, you can create more unique profiles and all, but for this nice little swept profile uh, for something like that contoured box look, um, you can, uh, you know, create that. Uh, and um, in, in the desktop, you know, pro as well. Okay. Cut those parts out, take them over to your saw, miter them, uh, you know, all four sides, and uh, make a decorative nice piece. All right. Now, uh, let's see here. You're not cutting through a path like a V carb bit. So, William Eden, uh, Edlin, sorry, uh, made a comment up earlier, and I saw it. A, um, I am previewing at the highest resolution, uh, Jerry Brown, but William Edlin said, think of cutting, think of the cutting line of the bit, which is very thin. Uh, you're not cutting a path like a V-carved bit. So what he was referring to is when we were doing the fluting, that cutting line of the bit, uh, very thin, I'm assuming he's referring to off the point. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're still with us, William. Um, the, uh, so when it was, uh, when we were having some simulation issues with the, with the, um, the miter cut uh, sample, um, I think William was trying to help me uh, understand why I was getting those rounded cuts and stuff. And so think of cutting a line, <coughs> cut, think of the cutting line of the bit, uh, which is very thin. Uh, you're not cutting a path like a V-carve. It's a, it's a profile cut and we're following a line. And in my case, um, if I were uh, doing the cut remember i said that uh we would have uh three lines and um three different depths uh that would be the method that i would take versus fluting and all of that stuff um let me review my uh point here um, i'm gonna draw a line from here to here I'm going to snap to the uh, center of these points. And my third line will be from here to here. And if I were to profile uh, cut these lines um, with a V bit, it would be, you know, if I were trying to miter cut this, it would be all run on the same tool path, right? But I would create three different tool paths. Um, so I would have my um, first cut would be a quarter of an inch, um, which is the length of the V blades of the 90 degree V bit. I would select that 60 degree V bit with half inch head or 90 degrees, sorry, with half inch head. And uh, I would be on the line and I would calculate that tool path. Okay, so if we look uh, at the cut we're creating is um, we've got this and let's get rid of the color. Uh, that's driving me nuts, that brown. <clears throat> okay, so we have this as our first cut. Now on the second line, I would create the profile cut, uh, this time um, stepping down 
starting at a quarter of an inch, even a little less, you know, but I'll start at a quarter of an inch and cutting to a quarter of an inch on the line. Calculate that toolpath. And um, notice where my V is ended. So my line is starting over here. I would really much prefer my line be here and all, but let's preview this cut and see if I went too far apart. So let's preview this cut. So see, I'm too far apart. I've got that step back up. I can't have that. The lines have to be right on each other. So for me to properly do this and know what the offset is, um, if I have a half inch bit um, and uh, from that uh, point is a quarter of an inch, I need to be a quarter of an inch away from this line. So I'm going to grab this, hold down my shift key, grab that. I am going to align myself right to the outside edge and then I'm going to move it relative to the position. I'm going to step over on my x-axis negative since I'm going to the left a quarter of an inch and create that toolpath. That would be the toolpath that this second cut would be on. Okay. So if I reset the preview and I preview both of those cuts once again, and let's zoom in to where we are. If I preview both of those cuts again, first one first. Okay. Now my third and final cut would be stepped over. I'm going to offset it. I'm going to offset it uh, another quarter of an inch over. Offset. Oops, wrong way. Offset outward a quarter of an inch. And that third cut, that third cut would be another profile toolpath. This time starting at a half inch down, cutting down an additional quarter of an inch for my total of a three quarter inch cut. I would calculate that toolpath and I would preview that toolpath and it would do my final cut, creating my full miter cut uh, all the way through. Um, if I wanted to go a little bit, a little bit, a little bit further, let's go 0 0.26, 0 0.26 and calculate that toolpath so it cuts all the way through. Um, preview. I have to be careful with that cutting through because it creates a witness line right there and I don't want that witness line. What that witness line is, is my straight edge of my bit. But if I stay at three quarters, it's going to cut through my board. I don't need to go that 0.76, uh, but that's going to give me a nice clean miter. That's what I was referring to when I said three lines and you'd have to step over when I actually drew the bit and I was simulating that to uh, Dennis uh, earlier uh, when he was asking. That's how I would, you know, cut a 45 degree miter on the table saw or on the uh, on the CNC. But there should be a way to do it as a fluting toolpath as well, which I was trying to do, but unsuccessfully. Um, this would be, you know, the method that I would I would use uh, to cut. But uh, there's another I was I was trying to show an alternative. And the alternative failed miserably. So I got to figure that out because we should be able to use a ramping toolpath to get that motion. But this would be a more optimized toolpath. It'd be much faster this way with the three lines set a quarter of an inch apart. And again, first cut starting at zero, cutting down a quarter of an inch. Second cut starting at a quarter of an inch, cutting down another quarter of an inch, getting me to half inch now. Third cut starting at a half inch and cutting down another. 0.25 we don't need to go beyond uh, you know will uh, you know give me that final cut to create that nice miter okay all right okay so um, so William Edlin I think you know I think he was thinking the same thing think of the cutting line it's not like cutting a v-car toolpath it's a profile cut and we're following the line and I think he was trying to help me explain it 
Uh, but I, I admit I didn't go, I didn't see his comment until earlier, till just now. So just coming back here. Um, is this going to be uh, uploaded for later viewing? Absolutely, Fred. All of our videos are recorded and they're uploaded the minute the class ends. And this class needs to end. We're at 11 o'clock now. This class has to absolutely end. We're way beyond uh, the three-hour mark and none of y'all are probably watching right now. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Jared uh, Rippert has said, uh, you have a square corner uh, on the inside cut. Right, exactly. I have a square corner on the inside cut, but not on the outside cut for that one. Uh, but for some reason, using my uh, larger diameter bit to uh, change the toolpath, I'm going to have to look into that and see why it was. Um, and uh, Wayne, on the base, could you have a pocket cut so that the box can sit in it? Sure, Wayne, absolutely. You can, you can create a nice profile and you can do a pocket cut so the box sits down right in it and you uh, seal it, glue it shut, or what have you. Um, I like my box sitting on the base because the base gets screwed in to the bottom, uh, and you typically mount or load the um, remains from the bottom of the box, and um, uh, you silicone it and screw it closed so it, it's never to be reopened again, of course, um, and, and sealed and all. Um, Let's see here. Now, okay, so William, okay, William, great job. He's holding it. So hold the bit in your hand and spin it. So if you travel up and down, you cut the point line. See, he's exactly right. I think, William, you're kind of, you're, that's, that's exactly what we're uh, demonstrating here with these three lines, right? That's what you're, you're just, you're just reiterating that, correct? Because if I do hold that bit and spin it in my hand, you see that cut line, that 45 degree. So I would want to cut vertically along the board versus those horizontal, uh, you know, little slots, those little lines I was trying to do. Um, but ramping, the ramping toolpath doesn't do vertical cutting. It only does horizontal ramping, uh, you know, um, for the most part. So I had to change my vectors. And all, but this is a more optimized way to do it anyway, with the three lines a quarter inch apart, different depths. Now, all three of these tool paths, when saved, all three of these tool paths would be uh, when you save them, you would output them as one file. So it'll run as one file, not three separate files. Um, and, uh, you know, when you save them, so you only have one tool path that you're running and you would do all your miters. This first line on every, each end of the board or each end of the piece and all four pieces, you would create that first profile cut for all of them. So that router would go zoom over to the next line, zoom, 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 you know, on all four lines, all four sides of the board, you know, cause there's four spots that need to get this miter cut. Then the second tool path, the next set of lines, you would do that uh, second tool path. And the third tool path would be the final set of lines. So that way with that one tool path that you're saving these three as, uh, it will do all of your miter cuts. Now just keep in mind that uh, if you're doing the miter cuts, make sure your clamps are not on the ends that are getting cut off. Make sure your clamps are somewhere running along these edges or something so that when these three parts get cut loose by that miter, you know, those, those, uh, those profile cuts uh, that your, you know what I mean? Your, your piece doesn't, you know, just like come loose, you know? So just make sure you're clamping and all. So William, thank you for that. Cause it, it you know, um, it's true. It's the, you know, it's a, it, you, any router bit you take and you, you hold it in your hand, you spin it and everything, especially a V bit, you know, that really demonstrates it, you know, uh, but you're cutting on that center line and those edges, those 45 degree edges, making that 90 degree V bit, that's what you're following. So we're following a single line that center of that bit is running right along that line and then uh, move over a quarter of an inch, move over a quarter of an inch, and that center of that bit's gonna follow that line at different depths to create that miter. All right, it's teamwork right there. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, we are way beyond a couple hours class for a simple box that we haven't even 
you know, that, that we're just showing different elements of it, haven't even put it together. Uh, I will create the entire project, both the front, the back, the side pieces, the top and the bottom. Uh, and uh, I will post those in the Facebook group, uh, Didwar Woodcarver Owners Facebook group. I will, uh, before I paste, post them in the Facebook group, I will cut this part. Um, uh, I love making boxes and stuff. So I will cut this piece and uh, with the inlay and everything uh, to show what it would look like so I can take photos, actual realistic photos of this image. And um, I uh, might even do a little... Um, little step-by-step -step PDF or something but uh, um, but this one will be posted shortly uh, give me a chance to shoot that video either tonight or tomorrow uh, I'll get out there and cut I got nothing better to do all right um, I want to thank you all uh, very much uh, for literally if you're still with me and watching I see some of you chatting in so um, this one is uh been a long class and i if, if you're there with me and you're missing the tonight show or whatever to stick and listen to me talk thank you for that we are going to call it a night uh hopefully uh there was some information in here uh you know we have this particular box is a box with a picture frame an oval picture frame area with a little bit of an uh, inlay with an overlap and you'll see how that looks and all uh in the actual project when i cut it um, I don't think I'm going to cut the word my in there because it would be morbid. My dog has not passed away yet, so I'll come up with some kind of uh, name or something there uh, as a little simulation. Or I could, you know, save it for her down the road, but that's still not, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but anyway, I will cut this uh, and uh, get it out to you in a little preview as well as the files all cleaned up and organized and named properly like we do. Uh, and... Um, just know that this is one of many styles 3d models uh you can you can instead of a picture you can do a 3d model you can do decorative uh, vines and and textures and things like that how this box ends up uh is on your imagination and what you want to do what you want to see and things i'm just showing you the very simple basics here on this in this particular box um, but one cubic uh inch of ash remains per pound whether it's human or uh, animal uh, and and then you want to uh, after you get that uh, measurement uh, length times width and then times height uh, you want to add 10 cubic inches to that for uh, extra space and all to make sure you don't you know get too tight all right Fido there you go I'll use Fido or something you know absolutely instead of Maya but uh uh, you guys have been wonderful sticking in, man, your troopers and all. I'm going to say good night. I've said it a hundred times, but this time I really mean it. Have a great night, and uh, until next time, I'll see you soon. Remember, uh, Wednesday, uh, we're going to be visiting uh, the revisiting the TNG. Uh, this time, it's going to be a little bit more organized and a little bit more detail. We're not going to focus on one thing like buttons and all. I'm going to show you how to make them now that I know how to make them, but I want to talk about... Uh, some of the new features because there is a new uh, update uh, available if somebody wanted to move over or download to that uh, that latest update 0.04 uh, they, they added some new tools and stuff so all of that we're going to review on Wednesday and um, I don't know what we're doing next week I got to think of it have a great night guys and girls goodbye Ha <laughs> ha.